All right. Today is Thursday, September 3rd, 2020. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Any questions before we get rolling today? Are we going to do a practice lecture and lab exam for the first exam like we did for 430? Well, we didn't do a practice lecture exam for 430. We did do a practice lab exam because most people coming into 430 haven't had a real science class before, haven't had a real lab exam before. And so it was an opportunity to, to uh, understand how that works. Uh, you guys are here in 431. You have been successful in 430. So you should know what a lab and a lecture exam look like. So uh, that isn't necessary from that format. What is important is that we understand the test taking protocol, which is what that Proctorio quest, that test was for. But everybody's done that and been successful with that and so uh, knows how to take an exam online if you haven't done that before. But I don't see the need to take the time to do a practice lab and lecture exam because you guys all know how to take lab and lecture exams because you're here in 431. All right, any other questions before we get started? All right, then let's talk game plans. Uh, today uh, is all uh, blood vessels. We'll talk about the structure and function of them today in lecture, and then we'll continue our exploration of them. Again, I'm not going over every blood vessel on your list, but I do wanna talk about some of the uh, asymmetries and other idiosyncrasies that happen with them as we work our way through that. A couple more days of lecture after today. Uh, we had a handful of assignments, a couple more unit reviews, uh, your cardiovascular exercise, which is graded for correctness, is due. Uh, your ph physio ex exercise five, where you have to do all of the activities, all seven of them. So that's seven lab reports. Uh, your unit, uh, your physio ex exercise 11, where you're just doing activity four. You're welcome to do the other ones because they're fun and entertaining, but four is the only one you're turning in. And you have another labster on hematology because we're finishing up the cardiovascular system with our discussion of blood. All leading up to Tuesday uh, the 15th when you are gonna take your lab and lecture exam. Uh, the exams have to be completed uh, during test, uh, class time. So that means they will not be available till noon and at noon uh, you will be able to start taking them and then you must have them completed. They must be completed. You can't start them. You must be completed by 4.35 p.m. So if you start the lab exam at 4.15, you're gonna have 20 minutes to complete that lab exam because everything gets shut down at 435. So it is important to make sure you complete them during those times. You are gonna use the Proctorio protocols as we're set up for the uh, syllabus exam, so you know how that works. Uh, make sure you scan your area slowly, your entire area slowly, uh, so that you don't lose those points for that. That is super important to do. Uh, make sure you show your ID and everything else that goes along with that. Uh, no headphones. Remember, please try to minimize the noise. I know those of you who are, uh, you know, homeschooling at home along with your kids and things like that, it can be a little challenging. But again, try to try to be respectful of that as much as possible uh, to help you to be successful on that. You may complete the test in either order you want. You can do the lab exam first or the lecture exam in either order. Uh, just make sure you get them both done. Uh, I haven't finalized them yet. Usually, this lab exam is usually somewhere between. 70 and 85, uh, pardon me, 70 and 85 questions, somewhere around that line. So you probably have about 90, 95 minutes to be able to take it. Uh, and then the lecture exam, uh, again, it varies from exam to exam, but on average, there are about 30 multiple choice questions. Uh, then you have somewhere between two and, I don't know, six or seven uh, fill in the blank answers. And then you usually have somewhere around eight essay questions. And again, be smart, sophisticated students. If you have an essay question that's worth three points, should you be writing four paragraphs in your answer to that? No, probably not. But by the same token, if you have an essay question that's worth 10 points, should you be writing one sentence for that? No, it'd have to be one hell of a sentence, right? And probably a really big long run on sentence for that matter as well to be able to get all the points. How many points something is worth should give you an idea of how much detail I want. Now that being said, it's always better to give me more detail than less detail. As I often tell students, I typically use a pen and a half of red ink on the first exam, writing things like describe or explain or and or expand or you know those kind of things. So make sure you're adding those descriptions, make sure you're doing those things. Uh, the lecture exam, depending on how long it is, usually has about two to two and a half hours of time for it. 
So if you think about it, worst case scenario, two and a half hours for the uh, lecture exam, uh, an hour and a half for the lab exam. So that's four hours right there and we have four and a half hours. So I encourage you to start early uh, so that if there are any technical issues uh, that you can deal with those. Uh, luckily during the summer, there weren't too many technical issues. Most of the technical issues, I'll warn you right now, occurred with the lab exam. So if you've got an older computer or, or, you know, or things like that that you're worried about, I would encourage you to start as close to noon as you can and to take the lab exam first to get over that hurdle. Uh, and again, while you have two and a half hours to complete the lecture exam, most people don't use all that time. Uh, so again, gauge your test. You at this point should know how you like to take your test. If you really like to luxuriate through a test through the excruciating detail, then yeah, you might use all two and a half hours or maybe two of the two and a half hours. If you're one of those that likes to race through it, then you may be done in an hour and a half. So try to plan accordingly. I encourage you to take a break in between the two exams, at least a 15 or 20 minute break in between the two exams so you have plenty of time to do that as long as you start early. All right. Then as, again, you're here in 431, these are things I shouldn't have to say. And so as of course you guys know, it is always important to be here in class and to be here in class on time. However, on Thursday the 17th when we come back, it is going to be especially important to be here because along with starting the lecture on the lymphatic system and moving on to the second section of the class, uh, on Thursday the 17th is when you will be randomly assigned into groups. Yes, it's going to be randomly assigned. I know many of you know each other from 4.30, uh, but it's time to meet somebody new or not meet somebody. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. It's random. Uh, uh, I will be putting you into breakout groups, and as I break you up into breakout groups, that will become your group. You will form a group, you will, once you form that group, you will come up with a topic for your 50-point presentation, and you can start working on that. Uh, we'll give you a couple of time, uh, some lab time in class for a couple of days uh, to be able to work on that, but it's not gonna be enough time to complete this activity. Uh, so you, I do encourage you to share contact information, email addresses, uh, you know, phone numbers to text, whatever it is that you guys wanna do that way. However, if you want to be more anonymous, or even if you don't want to be more anonymous, I will be on Canvas posting uh, discussion boards for each group. Uh, that will allow you the opportunity to communicate with each other asynchronously. So if you're, you know, if me and Nick and uh, Ruben are a group together, we may decide, all right, I'll do part one and Nick will do part two and Ruben will part, do part three. And maybe we can use the discussion board to post our portions of the presentation so that we can all look at each other and uh, activity and, and make comments and things like that and coordinate it and put it together. So you'll have those good discussion groups so that you'll be able to uh, communicate asynchronously as well. All right, and we'll talk about the topics. We'll talk about the format. We'll do all of that when we come back, like I said, on the 17th. So it's super important to be there. But for now, we need to focus on the things that are going to help you to be successful in this coming exam. All right. Questions on that? All right. It's done silence. That's always what I love to hear first thing in the morning. Excellent. All right. Let's go ahead and get started then. Blood vessels. So, again, your book, it's one of those things that, uh, again, they talk about that but don't necessarily emphasize. Up to this point in time, we have talked about three main types of blood vessels. And of course, what are the three main types of blood vessels we have identified? Arteries, veins, and capillaries. Arteries, veins, and capillaries. And remind me again, how did we define our arteries? Oops. They go away from the heart. Excellent, they carry blood away from the heart. And again, we can even emphasize that by saying all arteries carry blood away from the heart. There are no exceptions, right? Most are oxygen rich, but again, most is not all. How do we define veins? They carry blood to the heart. To the heart, excellent. And how do we define our capillaries? Uh, is it change of nutrients? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Where all exchange, exchange takes place. Exchange. Of materials take place. And you could also think about it as the turnaround point. Right, if arteries, 
uh, they can, or in simpler terms, right? Capillaries connect arteries and veins, right? So that one connects the other. So I like that. Eric's got it perfect. Excellent. So those are the three main types that we talked about, but there are actually five main types of blood vessels. Uh, and so when we talk about it, what are the two types of blood vessels we are missing? Arterioles. Excellent, one of them is definitely arterioles. Arterioles are more than just small arteries. They, all, they are small arteries but they are also incomplete. When we look at the anatomy of them, we'll see that they don't have all of the characteristics that an artery has. And arterioles are what actually directly feed the capillaries. Excellent. And what does that leave us with? Venules. 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 Uh, are basically small veins. And that really is the only distinction. Really the only distinction between venules and veins is the size, but also venules directly receive blood from capillaries. Excellent. So in that way, we have now identified our five main types of blood vessels. And I've written that out here, but we've got the pretty words that do all of that as well. All righty. If you were to take all the blood vessels out of your body and lay them out end to end, it would hurt a lot. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. Let's talk first about the anatomy of the blood vessels, uh, the arteries and the veins and the capillaries, because they tend to have fairly distinct anatomy. So obviously some characteristics in common, but some that are different as well. As we talk about the blood vessels, we will go from deep to superficial. And in this case, deep means closest to where the blood is. This is where the blood is. This lines the lumen. So what lines the lumen where the blood is located is our tunica intima, or also known as the tunica interna. Both of those are acceptable terms. Uh, it is lined with an endothelium. This endothelium, of course, is what type of tissue? What type of tissue is the endothelium? Uh, oh. It is an epithelial, you are right, it is absolutely an epithelial tissue. And the fact that if you remember, we said it was continuous with the endocardium of the heart. So excellent, that tells us and reminds us that it is a simple squamous epithelial tissue. And then it has the subendothelial, uh, blah, 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 the subendothelial layer, which is really primarily the basement membrane uh, but maybe also a very scant areolar connective tissue. It's mostly the basement membrane. If you remember all the way back to 430, basement membrane is that extracellular substance uh, that is that glue that holds the epithelial tissue to the tissue underneath of it. But there may be kind of a scant layer of areolar connective tissue located there as well. Uh, the second layer is the, come on, there, thank you. Oh, I should say before, again, one of the things we're going to emphasize is the differences between arteries and veins. And one of the big differences in arteries and veins is that in arteries, uh, deep to the endothelium is a layer of elastic fibers forming the internal elastic membrane. Why might we need an extensive elastic membrane inside of our arteries? They can dilate. True, although really we want to be careful with that. What's going to really cause the change in diameter to allow the blood vessel to dilate and, can, and uh, constrict? Pressure. 
Well, well, smooth muscle is this is going to be smooth muscle that is going to help us to change the diameter of our blood vessel. But you guys absolutely have the right idea. This is going to allow stretch to accommodate. One of the important things you have to remember, again, one of the important things, what makes the world go round? Pressure. Pressure. Pressure, absolutely. By having an elastic membrane, allows the blood vessel to deal with changes in pressure. We will talk about this a little bit, but as you know, it is possible to measure the pressures in an artery, like the brachial artery. I just happened to this weekend, I've had my you know monthly doctor's appointment, whereas I get to go in every month because they're always concerned about my blood pressure. And I got it taken. And as always, I've got a fairly standard range where it's usually at. And this time it was right about 312 over 217, right where I like it. Right. So good right. solid numbers for that there. Right. Is that a good positive blood pressure to have? Oh. Yeah. Ben, remind me. I'm That's teaching emergency online. Level. I'm teaching <laughs> online. I'm married and I have two daughters. So I think oh. for that, I think this is a fairly standard blood pressure. No. All right. Like 160. When they say this, though, what do we mean by this? What do we mean? Why are there two numbers? It's just it's all it does. Systolic and diastolic. Excellent. We have fancy names for them. A systolic pressure and a diastolic pressure. But I'll ask you now, what does that mean? Systolic is like ventricle pressure. Close. Remember, you're not measuring the pressure, but you've got the right idea. The systolic does refer to the contraction of the ventricle, right? So the systolic is the pressure in the blood vessel when the ventricle contracts. Whereas what is the diastolic? Relaxed pressure. When it's relaxed. Yeah, it's the pressure in actually let's do this underneath so do that there do that there do that there pressure in the blood vessel and more specifically when i say blood vessel let's even be more specific in the artery when the ventricle relaxes Why is there a difference in the pressure in our arteries when the ventricle is contracted and when the ventricle relaxes? Contraction produces a lot of pressure. Why? You're absolutely correct, but why? Blood is blocked. There you go. Because blood is being pumped out. Here's the big important thing about the heart. Having the heart pump blood isn't like the sink in your bathroom where you turn on the faucet and the flow is continuous. Is the flow of blood continuous coming out of your heart? Yeah. No, it's uh, not. It's... You, it ejects blood and then it stops ejecting blood. And then it ejects blood and it stops ejecting blood, right? We just went through the cardiac cycle in the last one. When the heart is at rest, blood's not coming out of the heart. When the atria contract, blood isn't coming out of the heart. When the ventricle first starts to contract and we're in our isovolumetric contraction, blood isn't coming out of the heart. It is only during ventricular ejection that blood is squirted out of the heart. And so when that blood is squirted out of the heart, what happens is you get this large bolus of blood that goes into your blood vessel. And if your blood vessel was a rigid, hard piece of PVC pipe, and you shoved a bunch of blood into it, what would happen to the pressure of that blood inside that rigid structure? It would, you would get a massive spike. So by having an elastic membrane, it allows it to stretch. And as it stretches, that reduces the pressure. It keeps the pressure from spiking. It keeps the pressure more moderate. But here's the other thing. You've got that hard, rigid PVC pipe. You cram all this blood into it and you get a spike of pressure, but as soon as you stop pushing blood into it, 
right? As that blood moved away and you have that rigid PVC pipe, what would happen to the pressure? Goes down. It would dramatically drop where our artery stretches to accommodate that bolus of blood. And then thanks to the recoil of the elasticity, when the blood isn't being pushed, it is able to recoil. And as the blood vessel gets smaller, it maintains a higher pressure. So that ability of the artery to be able to expand and recoil helps to cause massive fluctuations in the pressure. It helps to even out the pressure. It's not completely even, there is a different pressure when the ventricle is contracting than when it is relaxing. And again, for me, it's 312 when the ventricle is contracting and 217 when it's relaxed. But there's a big difference there. But those would be even more massive differences if we didn't have that elasticity. Now, why don't we need elasticity in the veins? By the time the blood reaches it, it's not nearly as big as a spike, maybe? Yeah, exactly. In fact, does anybody remember when first, when blood, here, let's leave this here, get it out of my way. When the blood first leaves the left ventricle into the ascending aorta, does anyone remember what we said the blood pressure? Do anybody go remember that chart we looked at? What the blood pressure would be in that case around? It's a 120. good number. Yeah, 120, 120 is a good number. Yeah. 120 millimeters of mercury, which is how we measure that. Anyone know what the blood pressure of blood in the uh, superior vena cava? as it is feeding blood into the right atrium. Anyone know what the blood pressure would be of that blood that is being filtered back into the heart from the superior vena cava when it finishes its journey and it's on its way back? It's okay if you don't know, we haven't talked about it yet. I was just curious if anybody knows. Perfect, Alex. Alexa knows, excellent, absolutely. Zero millimeters of mercury. It's actually zero. Because it's, so uh, our veins deal with much lower pressure blood. And because they deal with much lower pressure blood, they don't need that same elasticity. And I know probably up till this point in time, most of you haven't thought of it in these terms but I know you're aware of this because when you get a paper cut in your finger and it's a superficial paper cut and it is bleeding, that superficial paper cut is pretty much just cut veins. And what do you notice about the flow of blood out of that paper cut? Just kind of drips out. It's slow and it's a continuous drip, right? But what happens if instead you cut an artery? It squirts. Goes on whenever, the the, whenever the ventricle contracts, the pressure goes up and it squirts. And then it squirts and then it squirts. And every time it squirts is when your blood pressure goes up because of the heart beating. So yeah. in those arteries, you see changes in pressure that you don't see in the veins. All right. Excellent. Questions on that? All right, let's get rid of all of that. Talk about our second middle layer. That is our tunica media. It is a circular layer of what type of tissue? Smooth muscle. Squamous? Smooth muscle. There you go. Smooth muscle. Excellent. All right. And of course, with a circular layer, that allows us to change the diameter. We can dilate the blood vessels when we relax it. We can constrict it and uh, when we contract it. So by using it, and again, smooth muscle, we don't voluntarily control this. And this allows us to change the diameter, which is important because when we change the diameter, we change how much blood can flow into an area. We can change the blood flow that is going into that area. Excellent. What controls the smooth muscle of most blood vessels? Parasympathetic. 
Parasympathetic? Sympathetic? Sympathetic? All right, we've had both <laughs> answers now. Which one's correct? Or is it both? Both, I think. Is Are uh, our blood vessels dual innervated? I would say both. Well, I'm asking the question, so what's the obvious answer? If they were uh, dual innervated, would I waste the time to ask us the question? No, I wouldn't waste the time. So I'll ask the question again. Is it dual innervated? Does it receive input from both the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system? No. Yes. No. Which branch does it receive input? Most blood vessels almost solely receive input from. Sympathetic. Sympathetic. There you go. We got a couple people have mentioned it. Sympathetic nervous system. Remember, sympathetic nervous system, as we talked about in 430, affects the blood vessels, affects the skin, affects the adrenal gland. There are certain organs that uh, are only innervated by the sympathetic nervous system, and our blood vessels is one of them. If you think about it, um, think of it this way, too. If we're changing the diameter of a blood vessel, not only do we change blood flow, but what else would we change? If you change the volume of a blood vessel, what else are you going to change? Pressure. Pressure. So it also changes blood pressure. Remember with the heart, the sympathetic nervous system uh, uh, innervates the ventricles, but the parasympathetic doesn't, meaning that the sympathetic can make the heart beat stronger. And if the heart beats stronger, you pour, pump more blood into the blood vessels. And when you pump more blood into the blood vessels, what else do you affect? Pressure goes up. Blood pressure, absolutely. So notice both by affecting the ventricles of the heart and by affecting the smooth muscle of the blood vessels, it can change blood flow and it can change blood pressure. All right, any of that vaguely familiar to those of you who took 430? Which should be all of you. All right, I got one more for you. There's that pesky word. What's that pesky word again? Most. Most, what does most mean? Not all. Not all, excellent. What is the one set of blood vessels that is not innervated by the sympathetic and instead is innervated? Well, it is innervated by the sympathetic, but is also innervated by the parasympathetic. What blood vessels? Coronary. Innervates what blood vessels? Those of you who had me for 430 should hopefully remember this. Maybe point and shoot helps you recall. The mnemonic point and shoot ringing any bells. There you go. Reproductive organs or more specifically the blood vessels uh, that, that uh, control or feed, let's say it that way, the erectile tissue. In males, that is the penis. In females, that is the clitoris and the labia. Those blood vessels that feed that erectile tissue, cause them to be engorged upon arousal, are actually controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system. Arousal is a parasympathetic reflex. And again, you may not have known it in those terms, but I know you're aware of it because you take that special guy out on that special third date where you buy him a really nice meal at a really nice restaurant. And you do that because it's a third date and you expect something from him. Of course, he knows you expect something from him. So he might be a little bit nervous. And if he's too nervous, right, performance can be an issue. So of course you do with your men what I do with my men and that is to ply them with alcohol so that they're a little bit more relaxed and then you can get what you need from them. Not too much. Right? <laughs> Not too much, yes. Yeah, you, you don't want to end up with that whiskey problem, absolutely. But, but for the most part, it's just finding that right level. All right? All right, so again, it is, that is the only, so, and again, the mnemonic that we uh, talked about in 430, and we'll talk about when we get to the reproductive system, is point and shoot. Uh, arousal, the engorgement of the erectile tissue, the point is a parasympathetic. Ejaculation, sympathetic, so point and shoot. Uh, arousal and uh, orgasm, uh, that is your mnemonic for when we get to the reproductive system. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. Oops. Uh, now, 
anytime we have an internal something, there's probably a strong indication that we are going to have an external something to go along with it. And that is indeed the case here. Again, in arteries and only in arteries, uh, we have an additional layer of elastic fibers called the external elastic membrane, which is on the outer surface of the uh, tunica media. So if you think about it, the smooth muscle is surrounded by internal and external elastic fibers. Technically, the internal ones are part of the tunica intima. The external ones are part of the tunica media. Lastly, we have the tunica externa, or what can also be referred to as the tunica adventitia. We'll talk about those terms in a little more detail when we get to the digestive system and make more sense of them. So for right now, we can just use those terms interchangeably. This tunica externa is primarily a fibrous connective tissue. Uh, the internal and external elastic membranes are only in the uh, arteries. So, Tunica externa is mostly a fibrous connective tissue. What's the point in that? Just to hold it all together? Yeah, absolutely. Provide some structure and some support. And what else might it use for, be used for as well? Not only does it provide structure to that blood vessel, but what else does it do? Structure, support, and? Not allowing them to stretch too much. Kind of, it's not so much that they would stretch too much, but it definitely keeps them from moving around, right? If you're trying to take someone's blood from their arm, do you have to chase the blood vessel as it moves around, as blood <laughs> pumps into and out of it? Is that what happens with the arteries? You look at someone's arm and you see all the blood vessels wiggling around like worms underneath their skin? Hope not. <laughs> no, hopefully not. <laughs> You're absolutely right. That's a problem if you see that. Absolutely. The other thing that the tunica externa does is it anchors the blood vessels in place. So it locks them in place, provides a protective outer co coating to give them some structure, to give them some protection, and to anchor them to the surrounding tissues. All right. Let's take a look at the pretty picture. We've done all the pretty words. Let's look at the pretty pictures. Here we see an example of an artery. Now, first I want to point out looking at this picture and I need to move some of the stuff out of my way. That goes there and let's put this down here. When you take a cross section through the body and you see arteries and veins together, when you see them together, uh, there are some characteristics that make it pretty easy to distinguish which is which. Often blood vessels at the same level in your body. So like, for instance, if this is a cross section through your arm, the veins are going to be larger. They're going to have a larger lumen. Why might that be? Because of the low pressure. Right, absolutely. Remember, uh, the more the blood is in contact with the walls, the more friction there's going to be and the greater effect it's going to have on the flow of the blood. Since the blood in the vein is very low pressure, we want big, large blood vessels so that it can flow more smoothly through that. The artery can have a smaller lumen because it's dealing with higher pressure blood and it's easier for it to move through there. Notice also, as we talked about, not only does it have, as we can see here, the dark layers of the elastic membrane. These elastic membranes are very dark. Notice you can see some elastic fibers in the vein, but they're not nearly as distinct as what we see here in the artery. What is the uh, dark material surrounding the shape of the vein and arteries? This? Yeah. That's the tunica adventitia. Oh. Or the tunica externa. That's the outer layer. That's that fibrous connective tissue that's holding okay. it in place. Okay. Okay. Um, it can, yes, the, the blood pressure can and blood pressure will in, 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 can increase in the veins as you're moving more blood through them, yes. But they're always going to be much, much lower than it is in the artery. And it should always be zero when it comes back to the heart. If not, you have problems. And luckily, we have a way to fix that. All right, I have another picture I'll show you in just a minute that's a little bit of a higher resolution view of this, but I do, we can take a look at the illustration here that will show this as well. Notice again, as maybe I can do this with a highlighter. 
And like I said, I'll show this to you again on the pretty picture in a minute. We have that dark line here. That's part of the tunica and tima. That is that internal elastic membrane. And then out here, we see a nice example of that dark line that is the external elastic membrane. So we see that here. And that's kind of represented here with these fibers that they're putting here and these fibers that they're putting here, but not quite as distinct. They're much more distinct on the actual slide. Those, as I mentioned, provide some elasticity to this. And that's actually one of the characteristics that you can use to help you to distinguish an artery and a vein when you're just looking at one of them. When you're looking at them together like this, it can be pretty easy to distinguish them, to tell them apart. But on a lab exam, for instance, you might just see one of them. So one of the things that you should look at, and we'll see it even at the low magnification, you can see it here, but you can see it here much more clearly. Because of these elastic fibers, when you remove the blood from the artery, which you do when you cut it like this, it recoils. And when it recoils, what ends up happening is you get this scalloping or pleating of the endothelium. So notice it's not a smooth border. We have this scalloped or ruffled border to the endothelium on this uh, because of that recoil of the elasticity. So again, thicker wall, more muscle, because it's dealing with higher pressure, more smooth muscle, more of the elastic fibers, and that pleated or scalloped appearance of the endothelium are some of the characteristics you can use to distinguish them. Conversely, if we look at the, loom, uh, if we look at the vein, notice here the endothelium is much more smooth, much less, again, not completely void of elastic fibers, but not nearly as distinct as what we see in the artery. Typically a much smaller muscular wall. And sometimes the tunica externa will be bigger. Again, it's somewhat subjective, especially when you're just looking at them by themselves, but it can be a, a, one of the characteristics. And it's not the case on this one, but sometimes it can be. I have another, because I don't think I have it here. I don't think I put it in the slide yet. Larger lumen, scant no elastic membrane, sum of endothelium. Obviously it contains veins. You're not gonna see it in this cross section like this, but we will show those in just a minute. But before we go to those, let me share one more picture. Uh, this is the one I want. So I found this on the almighty Google. Obviously I wouldn't use this on an exam because it has all the labels on it. But again, it does a nice job of kind of showing this. Notice again, we have a larger lumen to the vein, smaller lumen to the artery, much, much larger muscular wall. So the tunica media is much, much larger much, much smaller here. Adventatia, a little bit larger here, a little bit smaller here. And again, it can vary. Here's a small artery. And again, notice we're not at the highest magnification, but we can still see that scalloped edge. We can see those dark lines of the internal elastic membrane along there, very, very distinct along this. Notice this one doesn't have as distinct of an external. Here we can see some of the fibers in here a little bit better but the external elastic membrane isn't quite as distinct, but the internal one on this one is very, very dark and distinct. Again, we can see some elastic fibers in this one, but not nearly as distinct, right? And even the smaller artery, we can see a very distinct internal elastic membrane on that as well. And there's the almighty nerves. So again, I could easily show you them together like this. And when they're together, they're much easier to be able to identify. But even if I just showed you one of these on an exam, you should be able to distinguish the characteristics of them independently and be able to identify, right? This one has a smooth endothelium to it, much thinner muscular wall. This one has that pleated or scalloped endothelium, much thicker muscular wall. You should be able to differentiate them even if I just give you one. All right, questions on that? Oh, sure. All right. Questions on the histology? 
All right, excellent. Let's talk about some of the more anatomy of these. Talking about our vowels. One of the things that happened as we talk about is that we are dealing with very high pressure blood in the arteries and very low pressure blood in the veins. So veins need a lot more assistance in helping them to get the blood back to the heart. Think of it also, we always assume the body's in anatomical position, which is standing up. And if you think about it, when you're standing up, pretty much three quarters of your body is below your heart. So not only do arteries have high pressure, but they're pumping the blood downhill. Veins have to pump the blood uphill, and they're dealing with it at lower pressure. So they need things to help. And one of those things that help is that it has valves. Artery, uh, arteries do not have valves, veins do. Notice if you look at these uh, valves, these valves look very much, in fact, they're almost identical to the valves that we found in the heart that are the semilunar valves. At rest, they're closed, but if we can form a large enough force, we will, I don't like that, let's go there, let's go there. We can force the blood up through those valves, and when the blood tries to go back down, it bounces into that cusp and closes the valve. And so it keeps the blood going in just one direction. Yeah, and it happens, a, I'm sorry. Go ahead. It happens with each contraction, right? No, not necessarily each contraction of the heart, uh, can, but you are of the right idea. If we're able to build up enough pressure in this vein, we can push the blood forward. One of the ways we can do that is with the pressure changes from the heart. But remember, these are so far from the heart, they don't really feel that. However, veins tend to be fairly superficial and happen to sit right next to muscles. And as we know, when a muscle contracts, that muscle changes shape. Most of the muscles in the body are parallel muscles. And when parallel muscles contract, they get shorter and they get wider. So if you had a muscle that contracted and as the muscles got wider, they squeezed that vein, could they help to push the blood through that uh, valve and move it back towards the heart? Yeah, absolutely. And if you don't like my pretty pictures, how about this one? Oh, remind me again. Someone remind me what muscle this is. Gastrocnemius. There you go, gastrocnemius. And I'd give you partial credit for that. Can we be a little more specific? Right, gastrocnemius. Okay, true. I was actually looking for medial belly of the gastrocnemius. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, again, uh, the gastrocnemius is what I was looking for. Notice as this person plantar flexes their foot, that causes the muscle to contract. And as the muscle contracts, it gets shorter and it gets fatter. So basically what happens is you have this increased pressure squeezing on the blood and the blood doesn't want to stay here. It can try to go down, but it's not going to be able to get past that valve. So instead, the blood is forced up, and as it is forced up, it closes, I mean, it opens that valve of the vein. As soon as the muscle relaxes, the pressure goes away. The blood may try to come back down, but as it tries to come back down, it's going to close the valve, and that blood is sitting here. Again, you may not have thought of this in these terms. But if you had two jobs where you were standing on your feet for eight hours a day, and one of them was waiting tables, where you're constantly running around the kitchen and running around the, the dining floor and everything else, and you had to do that eight hours standing up, or you had to do eight hours collecting tolls standing up in a toll booth, which of those two jobs would you rather do? Probably the moving around. Yeah, the one where you're moving around. Okay, maybe maybe you don't want to move around because you want to stand there, but whose feet are going to be more swollen at the end of the day? The guy who's in the toll booth or the woman who's been waiting? Toll booth. Yeah, if you're not able to move, then that's not going to contract the muscles as well, and you're going to have a harder time moving that blood back to your heart, and you're going to accumulate more fluid in your feet and get swollen feet as a result of it. You're going to be exhausted from running around waiting tables, right? But 
uh, you're not, your feet won't be quite as swollen. They'll be sore, but they won't be quite as swollen because you are moving the muscles more, and that helps to facilitate the movement of the blood back towards the heart. Oh, what about the tunica media muscles? They uh, also work as uh, the stretching. And con uh, true. Again, our tunica media is able to contract and dilate, but, and this is one of those really interesting things, every hollow organ we have seen in the body, we will see in the body moving forward too, uh, is capable of producing rhythmic uh, wave-like contractions of their smooth muscle in those hollow walls to propel substances through that. And what do we call that rhythmic contraction of the smooth muscle? Anyone remember? Peristalsis, excellent, peristalsis, absolutely, right? Blood vessels are the only hollow organs that really don't participate in peristalsis. And again, why is always one of those questions that's hard for us to figure out, but I guess the why in this case is it has a pump in the form of the heart. Would the veins performing peristalsis help to facilitate blood movement back? Yes, so why doesn't it do it? I have no idea, but it doesn't. It doesn't undergo peristalsis, so it isn't something that our veins are capable of doing. Thank you. It might be because they just have the one circular wall, whereas like the stomach and things like that have two layers, but the ureters just have one wall and they're able to undergo peristalsis. So I don't have a, I don't have a good answer for you as to why they don't use peristalsis, because you would definitely think that would be efficient, but it isn't. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have ways of helping the veins, and there's some other ways we can help the veins as well. I thought I had that here. I guess we'll talk about it later. All right, now are we on time? We are good. All right, excellent. So, we know the five main categories of arteries, of blood vessels, the arteries, veins, capillaries, arterioles, and venules, but let's talk a little bit more about the specific uh, anatomy of each of them. Starting first with arteries, as you see from the previous picture, there are actually two main types of arteries. Two main types of arteries. The first of those are the elastic arteries. Elastic arteries are also sometimes referred to as the conducting arteries. These are the ones that are most proximal to the heart, and therefore they deal with the highest pressures. And because they deal with the highest pressures, that's why they have the largest amount of elastic fibers in them. They're the ones that need to stretch and recoil the most to accommodate those massive changes in blood. So they are the largest in, uh, they're closer to the heart, largest in diameter, and contain the largest elastic membranes because they're closest to the heart, they're dealing with the highest pressures and the biggest pressure changes. And so they need to be able to stretch and recoil to be able to withstand that and keep a more continuous flow of the blood. Conversely, our muscular arteries are what are known as our distributing arteries, because they're the ones that distribute it to the different parts of the body. Our muscular arteries are also most of the named blood vessels in the body. All right, we have well over 600 named blood vessels in the body and most of the, or let's say this way, most of the named arteries. Most of the named arteries are indeed muscular arteries. Uh, these have the largest tunica media. And again, they're the distributing arteries because their job is to distribute, determine where the blood goes by changing their diameter. When they change their diameter, they change blood flow. Uh, where do I want to go like that? Yes. All right, having over five liters of blood in your body seems like a lot, but we have a lot of places we need to send it. So depending on what's going on in your body determines where we send the blood. If you've had a nice big cheeseburger for breakfast, then we're gonna dilate the blood vessels to our digestive system, sending more blood there, 
to completely break down that food that we just finished eating. Conversely, if we are sending it um, to the, uh, if we are getting ready to exercise or exercising, then we wanna send it to the muscles, we wanna send it to the heart, we wanna send it to the liver, right? And instead we'll constrict the blood vessels going to the digestive system. So in this way, we can regulate the flow of blood to meet the dynamic needs of the body. All right, questions on that? Excellent. All right, let's talk about the arterioles. Arterioles are the smallest, and again, there is a size relationship to them, as I mentioned. Uh, they are less than 30 microns in diameter, but again, uh, you know, that kind of information isn't something I need you to memorize. It isn't necessarily an important piece of information, um, but it is a, a, a distinguishing point. What is more interesting to me is, as we talked about, they are really incomplete uh, arteries. And by that, what I mean is they do not have all three tunics. An arteriole, as you can see from the illustration, oh, actually, I could, I'll go ahead and emphasize it and write it here, uh, does not have a tunic externa. And it has an incomplete tunica media. As you can see, it just has irregular banding of smooth muscle. So it isn't a full complete layer. It is just irregular uh, bands of uh, smooth muscle forming an incomplete tunica media. So it's more than just being a small artery. Arterioles really are different anatomically as well. All right, and as I said, their job is to feed into the capillaries, and they're often what are referred to as the resistance vessels, because resistance is what uh, is the opposite of flow. We have massive numbers of these arterioles, and let's say, if you're one of those special kind of people who happen to be allergic to bees or allergic to uh, peanuts or something along those lines, and you get a hold of some of that bee stings you, or you get some other type of antigen, like I said, that peanut protein or something along those lines, then what can happen is you can get an inappropriate reaction by the body, where you get a massive dilation of all of these arterioles, these resistance vessels. And when all of these blood vessels all dilate at the same time, what happens to your blood pressure? It tanks. Tanks. It tanks dramatically. And now you have trouble pumping blood to your brain. All right. And on top of that, you get a dramatic increase in mucus production in your airways. So now you can't get air. You can't get blood to your brain. You can't get oxygen into your blood. What do we call that condition? Shock. Yeah. And what kind of shock? Anaphylactic. Anaphylactic shock. Absolutely. So how do you resolve that? What do I carry with me everywhere I take my daughter? EpiPen. An EpiPen, a shot of epinephrine, right? Stimulate the sympathetic nervous system because what does the sympathetic nervous system do? It causes systemic blood vessels to constrict, increasing blood pressure, bringing the blood back up to the brain. It dilates the smooth muscle in the airways, opening up the airways so that they can get the air that they need and hopefully keep them alive long enough to get to the hospital. All right, so that's what happens here with those arterioles. Our capillaries are our smallest blood vessels, tiny in diameter. In fact, the diameter of the blood vessel is only big enough so that a single red blood cell can get through. They have to line up in a conga line to get through these capillaries. Another big difference about the capillary is that they are comprised of just one layer of tissues one tunic. As you look at the illustration, you see there is no, uh, where to go? There is no tunic externa. There is no tunica media. 
only that uh, uh, oops, only uh, the uh, tunica interna And essentially what we have is one layer of simple squamous epithelial tissues with the basement membrane. <coughs> That's it. That's all the capillary is. One single layer of simple squamous epithelial tissue with a connected basement membrane or basal lamina holding it in place. Why? Why so thin? Why so tiny? So that gas exchange and materials can be exchanged across. Yeah, exactly. Remember, this is the only location <coughs> where exchange takes place. And getting oxygen into your cells, getting CO2 out of your cells, getting nutrients and chemical signals to your cells, getting wastes and toxins out of your cells, all of that is vitally, vitally important. And that entire exchange at the capillaries is passive. Remind me again what that means? No ATP. Yeah, does not use ATP. And so if it does not use ATP, we rely on diffusion. And what is one of the characteristics that can make diffusion occur faster? Do you want a big, massive uh, distance? a long distance that that oxygen has to travel to get out of the blood vessel? No, no you want to have a thin, uh, short distance. And is there anything thinner in the body than a simple squamous epithelial tissue? No. no, so since we're relying on diffusion, we want to have as short of a distance as possible for diffusion. <laughs> so just having a single layer of cells is sufficient for that means. All right, how are we on time? We're doing good, excellent. All right, now that is the general anatomy of a capillary, but there are three main types of capillaries. So let's take a look at and discuss our three main types of capillaries. The first one is what we call a continuous capillary. It is called a continuous capillary because the capillary's wall is continuous. It is complete and it is intact. All right, so notice here, we see our simple squamous cells, All right? These spaces in between, let's use the highlighter to emphasize this with a little bit of green. This space in between is what is known as the intercellular cleft. This intercellular cleft between the cells is the space where a lot of the materials is going to be able to diffuse into or out of the cell. So we're gonna diffuse, diffuse into and out of the cell through those intercellular clefts. Yes, some material can pass through the plasma membrane. Things that are small, things that are nonpolar, things that are lipid base can just pass through the cell, but things that are polar, water, things along those lines are gonna sneak through the cracks through those intercellular clefts, and that's the primary way they're gonna get into and out of the capillary. Now, this capillary, we see its size, as we mentioned, obviously that red blood cell isn't gonna fit through that intercellular cleft, but do we, do we necessarily want that red blood cell leaving the capillary? No, we don't want that leaving the capillary. It's healthy, carrying oxygen, we wanna keep it in there. Absolutely, but the oxygen it's carrying can get in and out. And the same way, large proteins won't be able to get in and out this way as well. So it allows little things to get in and to get out. And this is going to be useful for a lot of locations in the body. All right. So is water able to be exchanged here? Absolutely. Water gets exchanged through that intercellular cleft as well. Absolutely. Now, it is good that things get in and out that intercellular cleft. However, in one location in particular, there are a couple others, but there's probably one at least that you are aware of. 
uh, we want to maybe help restrict how much stuff comes out of here. So one of the things we might want to do is form some tight junctions between these cells to kind of tighten up the intercellular cliff, clefts and limit how much materials can get out. So where might we want to use those tight junctions to make this exchange more exclusive, more selective, more restrictive? Excellent, nervous tissue, right? As we talked about, nervous tissue is one of those places where we need to protect the nervous tissue. So we put tight junctions on these capillaries to be able to protect that brain as forming part of that blood brain barrier. Uh, and wasn't there an assisting cell in that nervous tissue that also could wrap around this capillary to help to make that restrictive blood brain barrier? If only I'd learned my neuroglial cells when I was in 430, I might know which neuroglial cell. Excellent, the astrocyte, perfect. Our astrocyte is that neuroglial cell that also helps to wrap around those tight junctioned continuous capillaries to be able to limit what gets out and into our nervous tissue. All right, this is excellent. But aren't there times when we might want to get larger materials, larger proteins, larger nutrients into and out of a capillary? Shouldn't be. Yeah, well, I'm asking the question, so what's the obvious answer? The obvious answer is absolutely yes, excellent. Luckily, we have a capillary that can do that. It is called a fenestrated capillary. Notice a fenestrated capillary also has an intact endothelium. with tight junctions, uh, pardon me, with intercellular clefts. But notice this type of capillary also has pores in them. Of course, we couldn't get away with a simple word like pore, so they have to give them a fancy anatomy and physiology name. And that fancy anatomy and physiology name is a fenestration. So these fenestrations is really just a fancy way of saying a large pore in the plasma membrane of our, or through the plasma membrane, I should say, of our endothelial cell, allowing materials, larger materials, larger nutrients, larger chemicals to get in and out. Where might something like this be useful? Where might we want larger things getting in or getting out of our blood vessels? Digestive system. Digestive system, right? You have that nice big <coughs> cheeseburger for breakfast, and we want to be able to absorb those nutrients and get them to our body, and absolutely. Our kidney is another great example. In we are brain. filtering our blood in our kidneys. During the course of a day, 24 hours of period of time, you filter 200 liters of filtrate out of your kidneys using these fenestrated capillaries. Now, do you have 200 liters of extra fluid in your body? Anyone have 200 liters of extra fluid in their body? No, of course not. I hope not. <laughs> did, did you produce 200 liters of urine today? No, if you did, you'd be, we'd be giving this lecture in the bathroom, absolutely. So we need to absorb, reabsorb most of that back into the body. In fact, we reabsorb over 99% of that back into our body and instead only produce one to two liters of urine during the course of the day. But in that filtering process, this allows larger proteins, larger molecules to get in and to get out of that blood vessel. But again, is that pesky red blood cell going to be able to sneak out of here in this particular case? Can a red blood cell sneak out of fenestration? No. No, of course not. And again, we wouldn't want it to. So again, these allow for easier capillary absorption and filtration like in the digestive system, like in our kidney, and in some cases like our endocrine glands where we're gonna produce hormones, large hormones can get in that way. Someone remind me, what was the choroid plexus again? That name looks vaguely familiar, but I can't seem to place it. A network of capillaries, network. It is a network of capillaries that does what? Is the choroid, there you go, it makes our cerebral spinal fluid, right? located within the ventricles of our brain. And there was another neuroglial cell that wrapped around those 
uh, capillaries to make our cerebral spinal fluid. And what was that other neuroglial cell that helped us to make cerebral spinal fluid? Is it satellite cells? No, it was in the satellite cells. Satellite cells wrap around the cell bodies of our peripheral neurons. So they do wrap around. Schwann cells wrapped around to make the, uh, uh, the myelin. What was the epithelial type cell that lined the capillaries to make the choroid plexus? Anyone? It was an epithelial type cell. It was an epithelial type cell. So not, not the astro astrocytes, not the oligodendrocytes, although those are all good neuroglial cells that we learn, but not the right one. Also lines the central canal of our spinal cord. Epithelial type cell. Ep um, uh, epin epin uh, epidymal cells. Epidymal cells. Epidymal <laughs> cells. There you go. I already and finally pulled it. Epidymal cells. Excellent. Those epidymal cells were the ones that helped to form our choroid plexus. All right. Excellent. I believe you're right. All right. So again, a lot easier for things to get in and out of here, but not that blood vessel, which is a good thing because I mean with that blood cell, because we don't want that red blood cell to get out. Or do we want that red blood cell to get out? What do we know as you look at that red blood cell? What's unique about that red blood cell? Well, it's not unique about it, but what is one of the, the unique characteristics about red blood cells? They carry oxygen. They carry oxygen because they are big bags of hemoglobin. What is that cell not have as I look at it? A nucleus. It doesn't have a nucleus. Exactly. That's what red blood cells do. Red blood cells make a massive amount of hemoglobin, fill themselves up with 250 million hemoglobin molecules, so much so that they're like, you know what? I don't need this nucleus anymore. And they chuck that nucleus in much of its organelles and just basically becomes a big bag of hemoglobin. And as a big bag of hemoglobin, can that red blood cell last forever? No, that red blood cell is only gonna last about 100 to 120 days. So as that red blood cell wears down, don't we want to get it out of the blood vessel? And if red blood cells die, don't we need to get new ones into the blood vessel? Yeah. So we are gonna need some highly specialized blood vessels to let really big things in and out. And that's this wonky looking fella right here, our sinusoid capillaries. Notice our sinusoid capillaries have large fenestrations. But even more than the large fenestrations, their epithelial layer, is incomplete. There are large gaps between cells. And these large gaps between the cells are going to be big enough spaces where large things like, an ox like a red blood cell or large things uh, like a white blood cell or other things can get into and out of the capillary. Now, if we're going to have big, large, fancy sinusoid capillaries like this, where might be one of the locations we would want it so that we could get new blood cells into it? Bone marrow. Yep. Excellent. In the bone <laughs> marrow, right? If we wanted to get rid of red blood cells and recycle them, where might we want to do that? Liver. Spleen and the liver. Excellent. So those are the types of places where we're going to find this highly specialized highly modified capillary, these sinusoid capillaries, places like the liver, the bone marrow, uh, lymph nodes, uh, the uh, you know, uh, spleen, and even some endocrine organs where we can get large amounts of hormones into them. So it's a big, loose sinusoid capillary. How do they have these specialized type of capillary? We're big things, even something as big as a red blood cell can get into and out of the capillary. So like going down the list from like capillary to continuous to fenestrated, it just kind of gets looser. 
Uh, it gets more permeable. How about that? I say in a fancy way, it makes it easier for things to get in and out. So the, the fancy way that we would say that is more permeable. Absolutely. The continuous are the least permeable and this is the most permeable capillary. This is the one that it's easiest for things to get in and out and largest things can get in and out. And right. continuous is where the least things can get in and out and only small things can get in and out. And then fenestrated falls in between. Excellent. Great point. Any others? All right, with that, we are done with our capillaries for the uh, anatomy. For, uh, pardon me, let me rephrase that. We're at done with the microscopic anatomy of the capillaries, but there is a little bit more anatomy we need to talk about for our capillaries. Capillaries from a gross anatomy standpoint are arranged in a capillary bed. All right, let's take a look at one of these with the fancy picture here. Remember, as we've talked about, and I'll use my highlighter for this, and uh, I think green works. An arteriole, notice here we see the arteriole with its incomplete uh, tunica media, no uh, tunica externa. Uh, so that arteriole feeds into the capillary. And our capillary is fed out into a venule. So we feed in by a capillary, we feed out by a venule. All right. Now, uh, what's interesting about the capillary is there's really two main pathways through the capillary. The first main pathway through the capillary is what is known as the thoroughfare channel. The thoroughfare channel is basically a primary pathway through the capillary that connects the artery to the vein and allows it to turn it around. Off of that are what are known, and let me switch the color here. We'll go, it should show up good. Let's see if pink shows up good. I don't know, maybe not. Uh, we'll go with yellow. Um, off of this, all the rest of these are these, what we refer to as the true capillaries. So these are our true capillaries, and let's write that out. And these true capillaries are arranged in this elaborate bed-like structure. But I want you to notice something else about these true capillaries. On these true capillaries, and I'll use brown from this, there are little pieces of smooth muscle that wrap around the openings to our true capillaries. And these are known as our pre-capillary sphincters. These pre-capillary sphincters, as we see from the picture over here, is smooth muscle that wraps around the entryway to the true capillaries. And what it allows us to do is regulate flow through them. Let's look at a little bit of a simpler picture. Here is a simpler picture that kind of shows the same thing. Again, notice we have our arteriole, we have our, whoops, wrong button. We have our venule and we have that thoroughfare passageway or what is also known as the vascular shunt that connects the two together. We then have our true capillaries that come out and form this elaborate bed-like structure. And the passageways to the true capillaries are controlled by these pre-capillary sphincters little smooth muscle valves. And they regulate the flow of blood into our true capillary. Right, let's say for instance right now, while you're sitting here listening to my lecture, how active are your legs? Right? Unless you've had too much coffee and you're shaking your leg a whole lot while you're sitting here in class, they're not doing a whole heck of a lot. So do you necessarily need to diffuse all the pre -clap, uh, pardon me, all the true capillaries of your legs, making sure that your legs are getting lots of oxygen and lots of nutrients and lots of materials? No, it's not an efficient use of your resources. So in those types of cases, what we're able to do is constrict those pre-capillary sphincters and limit the blood flow into that capillary. 
Now we still need the blood to have a turnaround point. So know that notice that that vascular shunt, that thoroughfare passageway is still open. Blood can still turn around in this capillary and go back. A little bit of blood's going to the area. But if we don't need a lot, if there isn't a large demand of oxygen and nutrients or removal of waste, we can constrict blood flow. And of course, what kind of things control these precapillary sphincters? Well, they're related to the blood vessels, so what do you think would control them? Parasympathetic. Does parasympathetic control most of the blood vessels of the body? No, sympathetic. Controlled by the sympathetic nervous system? Yeah. Right. And also by what? What do you think can also control these things? If only we had another organ system that was specialized for communication. Endocrine. Hormones, there you go, excellent. Perfect, the endocrine system and our hormones. All right, again, you're sitting here in your class and a bear with an ax walks in the door and you get scared. And one of the things, ways people can tell you're scared is by your face gets pale, your skin gets pale because all those blood vessels constrict, those precapillary sphincters constrict, drawing blood away from the surface of your skin because we need to get it to the heart, we need to get it to the muscles, we need to get it to the lungs to deal with that bear with an ax. Or conversely, you're standing up in front of the class giving a presentation and your pants fall down. And when your pants fall down, the, uh, that sympathetic response, those hormones cause a dilation of those precapillary sphincters in your face and suddenly all the true capillaries of your face get flushed with blood and you get very red as a result of that, from that embarrassment, right? In this fashion, we can control the movement of blood, the diffusion of blood into the area to, again, increase or decrease exchange depending on the need. All right, questions on that? All right, let's finish our path back real quick because this is gonna be easy. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, venules and the veins basically have the basic same anatomy. They both have all three tunics, intima, media, and externa to them. So really the main difference between a venule and a vein is one size, venules are less than 50 microns in diameter. And remember, it's the venules that directly receive blood from the uh, capillaries. Again, they typically have a larger lumen than the arterioles. Remember, arterioles are only about 30 microns and venules are 50. But again, you don't have to memorize that number. I just use it to show the difference. Technically, we have medium size and large size veins. But again, the really the only difference in them is size. All right, so medium veins have medium sized lumen. Large veins have a large size lumen. Thinner walls, less muscle, because again, they're dealing with lower pressure blood. So the only difference between venules and veins is uh, their size, not the their size. The only structure. difference between venules, medium-sized veins. veins, and large-sized veins is the size. Mm -hmm. The size is really the only. I know our picture here doesn't show a tunica media, but it does have. So don't get confused by that. It does have a tunica media. Even though our picture here doesn't show it, it does indeed have it. So all three do indeed have all three layers. So really the only difference in the veins is the size. It's really the only difference. Okay. You gonna make us identify like if it's a large vein or a medium vein? No. Okay. No. All righty. Questions on that? All right, excellent. I think that with the anatomy down, we still have some more physiology to do, but I think this is a good stopping force, uh, stopping place for our first break. So let's go ahead and take our first break. It looks like it's 120. So let's come back and restart at 135. And I will start the recording at that time. 
All right, any questions before we take our break? Oh, great question. Uh, valves, yeah, valves are basically the same in the medium and the large size, yes. I mean, obviously, if it's a larger lumen, it needs a larger vein, but the anatomy of them are the same. All right, any other questions? Let's go ahead and get started. Any questions before we dive back in? All right, excellent. So let's talk about blood distribution. As we talked about, blood is constantly being circulated throughout the body. But as we talked about, uh, the pressures that are driving it are very, very different. And we see that difference in where the blood is located. Notice, again, because of the small size of the heart, only about 8% of our total blood volume is in the heart at any one time. Right? Not surprisingly, even though we have the massive number of capillaries, remember, as we talked about, capillaries are so tiny that our red blood cells have to line up one at a time to get through them. Their overall volume is relatively small. Only about 12% of the blood is in the pulmonary circulation going to and from the lungs. So that means about 75% of the blood is passing through our systemic arteries and veins. However, as you notice, the difference in them is dramatically different. Only 15% of the blood is located in our arteries, whereas 60 is in the veins. Again, these veins basically act as a reservoir for blood. It is blood that is at very low pressure, so it is slowly chugging its way back towards the heart. However, like we talked about, it does have a tunica media, so if you need to exercise, if you need to you know, run from that bear with an ax, we have the ability to constrict those veins and force the blood back into the heart more quickly. That would increase our preload, as we talked about, by sending the blood back more rapidly to the heart so that we are able to increase that spread of the blood to the parts of the body that need it to deal with that stressful situation or that vigorous exercise or whatever it else that we are doing. All right, questions on that? All right. Now, as we mentioned, our veins need help. The capillaries, coming out of the capillaries, the blood pressure is very, very low. In fact, as we will see, and we'll talk about this in just a minute, the pressure of the blood as it leaves the heart, what did we say it was? 120. 120 millimeters of mercury, excellent. When it leaves the capillaries, it's at about 17 millimeters of mercury. And what did we say that it was going to be when it gets back to uh, the right atrium? Zero. Zero. Zero millimeters of mercury. So notice our pressure gradient here is only 17 millimeters of mercury. That is a very small pressure gradient. So it is very hard to get the blood to go back to the heart through our veins. So there are lots of things that help with that process. We have very large lumens, which is going to help with the blood flow. We have those one-way valves. We have the muscular pumps. All of those are ways that we can help to assist it. But there is an additional way we can as well. And that additional way is what is known as the respiratory pump. Let's do some drawing here. So I'm going to cheat and get rid of this vein right there so that we have some room. And I will, using my masterful drawing skills, draw two thoracic cavities. And more specifically, uh, no, that thoracic cavities, draw two uh, ventral body cavities. The ventral body cavity, remind me again, is divided anatomically by what structure? Diaphragm. Diaphragm, excellent. 
That diaphragm, remember, is a curved shape, bell shaped muscle. We use that diaphragm to do what? Breathe. Breathe, absolutely. When we contract that diaphragm, what happens to that curved bell shaped muscle? It goes up. It goes up? Flattens. Right, when a curved muscle, like all muscles, when they contract, get shorter. And when a curved muscle gets shortened, shorter, it flattens out. So what happens here is this flattens out when it contracts to something like that. And as we know, that is going to increase the volume in our thoracic cavity. So in our thoracic cavity, uh, the volume is going to go up. And when volume goes up, what happens in our thoracic cavity? The pressure goes down. Pressure goes down. And when pressure goes down, that causes air to come inside. Right? That's how we breathe in. <gasps> how we breathe in. Excellent. But notice also, when the diaphragm contracts, while it increases the volume of the thoracic cavity, it also affects the abdominal pelvic cavity. And what does it do to the pressure in the abdominal pelvic cavity? Or what does it do to the volume in the abdominal pelvic cavity? It lowers the volume. Of, yeah, here the volume uh, is going to go down. And when the volume goes down, what happens to the pressure here? Goes up. Pressure goes up. Excellent. Conversely, when the diaphragm relaxes, when it relaxes, it goes back up to its curved state. And when it goes back up to its, whoops, wrong button. When it goes back up to its curved state, as we know, the pressure in our thoracic cavity goes down, which uh, volume goes down, which allows the pressure goes up and we breathe out. But again, it is also gonna change the volume and the pressure of the abdominal pelvic cavity. So that in this case, the pressure is going to go up. And, I mean, the volume is gonna go up and the pressure is gonna go down. So notice as we breathe, not only do we change the volume and the pressure, of the thoracic cavity, but we affect the volume and the pressure of the abdominal pelvic cavity as well. So let's think about what happens then to the blood in our veins. When the pressure in the abdominal pelvic cavity goes down, that decrease in pressure is going to draw blood to the abdominal pelvic cavity. Up the legs towards the abdominal pelvic cavity. All right? Oops. To the abdominal pelvic cavity. However, when the pressure goes up, that blood doesn't want to be there anymore. But thanks to the one-way valve, the only way it can move is to continue up towards the heart. So when the pressure increases, it drives the blood back towards the heart. This respiratory pump then also plays a really important role in helping to uh, move the blood through the veins, draw it back to the heart, especially for the legs. Now, this is all great and fine and dandy as long as we can make major changes to the volume and therefore the pressure of the abdominal pelvic cavity. But what happens if you have to happen to have a little bit of extra fat in that area? Or maybe a lot of extra fat in that area? Or maybe you happen to be seven months pregnant and are carrying a basketball inside of your belly. With that increased pressure from the baby, from all that subcutaneous fat, are we able to change the volume and the pressure of our abdominal pelvic cavity as easily? No, and so one of the things that many late-term pregnant women deal with is massive swelling of their feet by the end of the day. And one of the reasons for that is that basketball sitting on their bladder basically restricts their ability to take advantage of this respiratory pump and be able to help to draw the blood back towards the heart, 
right? They typically don't want to walk around too much. You don't want to probably be waiting out, uh, tables for eight hours if you are, or, you know, or running a half marathon or something like that if you're eight months pregnant. So you tend to get massive swelling of the ankles and feet. Uh, it very, is very common in late-term pregnancy because of, our, of the decrease in the ability to be able to use these types of assistances to get the blood back to our heart. So at the end of the day, what does that pregnant woman do to help? Elevate your feet. Elevate the feet. You elevate the feet, and now you get to use gravity to help to, uh, to drain that. My, my wife, when she was pregnant with our first child, uh, not only was she having issues with her feet swelling, but uh, our, our first daughter uh, uh, sat really high, so she was having major issues with acid reflux. So basically, she spent the last two months of her pregnancy on the couch, basically propped up like a V had a bunch of pillows behind her head to hold her head up so that the acid reflux wasn't a problem and a bunch of pillows at her feet holding her feet up so that they would drain. And so she basically slept like a taco every night for two months. It was awesome. I had the whole bed to myself. It was great. All right. <laughs> Excellent. Questions on that? All right. Perfect. So these are all things that help in that blood flow. The last thing that helps, and again, this is a concept that we certainly understand, is having alternate routes for the blood to travel. Again, I'm gonna have to work on my analogies because we're not in the classroom, but normally when we're sitting in the classroom, as I point out to you, there is more than one way for you to get to campus, right? If you're in Roseville and there is a 24 car pile up on 80, you can come down Auburn Boulevard to get to campus that way by having multiple routes by which you can get to a destination. If there is congestion in one area, you have an alternate route to go. And again, we're not talking about major changes in pressure, right? If you think about our pressure grading, it's from 17 to zero. So if an area's pressure goes from eight to 10, that's a huge change and that can dramatically change the flow of blood. So if it's 10 in this route and six in that route, the blood can go that alternate route. And again, if you remember, we had a fancy name for these alternate routes, these elaborate networks of blood vessels, we called them anastomoses. Anastomoses, of course, is the plural. The singular is, of course, amastomosis, I-S at the end. These uh, vascular anastomoses are interconnected blood vessels to give multiple routes for blood to flow. Why? Why do we need these multiple routes? In case anything happens to any of the other blood vessels? Yeah, in case there's damage, in case there's changes in pressure as we talked about. Why else might it be important to have multiple routes for blood to travel? Spread to multiple areas. True, it can help to spread to multiple areas, but what else? What if I told you, for instance, that one of the areas where you find a lot of anastomoses are in your joints? Why might it be important to have an anastomosis in oh, your joints? So blood can rush that area if it needs to heal it or something. True, it can play a role in healing, absolutely. Why else might it be important? If you're in a position where it's cutting off one, it yeah. can take another round. Think of it this way. If you had one long straight blood vessel that carried blood through your knee to your toes, and as you were sitting here in your chair right now, how many of you have your legs out straight? All right, maybe it's those of you who are sitting on bed or on your couch might have your legs out straight, but many of you have your legs bent right now. And if you bent your leg and kinked that one blood vessel that was carrying blood down to your toes, what would happen? Lose yeah, blood would stop going to your toes, but that's okay. Lecture's only four and a half hours. It's okay if your knees, if your toes don't get blood for four and a half hours, right? That okay? Is it okay for your well, if you don't like your toes yeah. and you want to lose it? No. Uh, by having anastomoses in joints, it doesn't matter what position the joint is in, there are going to be routes for blood to be able to get to their destination. So joints are another area. It protects us in joints. It protects us from congestion or damage, making sure that areas get their blood. Now, as I mentioned, these are much more common in veins because they're typically more elaborate processes in veins because they're dealing with lower pressure, so we want more routes to get there. But there can be arterial anastomoses. 
these provide alternate routes or collateral pathways uh, for blood to get any particular region. And what were the two areas that we said had a lot of arterial anastomoses? The brain. The brain yeah, and, heart. and the heart, absolutely. The heart. And in fact, what did we call that fancy anastomosis in the brain? Cool. I heard it, say it again. Circle of Willis. Circle of Willis, excellent, right? Da, 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 da. The Circle of Willis. That Circle of Willis is a great example of an arterial anastomosis, right? So that if there's blockage or change in pressure, it doesn't matter. We can still get the right amount of blood to the right parts of our brain so our brain keeps functioning normal. All right? And if you think about it, that vascular shunt that we talked about is kind of an arterial venous anastomosis. Its job is to connect the two of those together. So that again, we have that alternate route of blood to get from the artery to the vein. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. So as I have said many, 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 many times, chemistry is stupid and pointless. But what isn't is physics. Physics is fun. So let's talk some physics. The goal of our cardiovascular system is to move the blood, right? And to do that, when we talk about the movement of blood from one location to another, we are talking about the flow of blood. And flow is going to be directly proportional to the difference in blood pressure, right? Make sure we understand that. If I have two blood vessels, and let's draw two really simple blood vessels there, there's a blood vessel and there's a blood vessel here. And if on this side, we have 100 millimeters of mercury pressure blood at this end, and this one here has 50 millimeters of blood, um, pressure uh, blood at 50 millimeters of mercury, which one of these two blood vessels here, blood vessel A or blood vessel B, are we gonna see the fastest flow of blood? A. A? Come on, I want answers to this. Say it or type it. Don't make me waste the time to make a poll where I have to go onto the website and I got to write in the question and come up with A's and B's. A, 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 everybody says A, because A is totally obvious. Oh, there's one B. Now, are you saying B because you know that I don't like obvious answers and so you're just assuming it is, or? Can you really know? Let's ask that question that way. Do you really know? You don't really know because remember, Flow is based on the difference of blood pressures. And here, you don't have what's on the other side. Ah, B, because it's larger diameter. Okay, well, that's just my poor drawing skills. Uh, what if I told you the pressure over here, assuming the blood vessels were the same, is 90 millimeters of mercury, and the pressure down here is 10 millimeters of mercury. Now, which one has the greater flow through it? B, absolutely, mm -hmm. right? It isn't the absolute pressures, it is the difference between the two locations that determines how fast blood is gonna flow. So it is the difference. So here, the difference is 40 millimeters of mercury, so it is gonna go much faster here than here where it's only 10. In fact, because it is directly proportional, right, this is actually gonna be four times faster than A will be because the difference is four times greater. 40 is four times greater than 10. So it is directly proportional. All right, that makes sense? Excellent. Now, as we talked about, the steepest changes in blood vessels occurs in the arteries. I've kind of already given you this. And we actually have a pretty chart that shows this. I think I show this to you here. And in those arteries, remember, especially the elastic arteries, that part, that blood pressure is pulsatile. It fluctuates based on whether the ventricle is ejecting blood or isn't ejecting blood. And also blood flow is inversely proportional to resistance. We'll talk about that in a second. I want this, oh, I thought I had that. Okay, I lied, we'll get to that picture. Actually, I wanna do that now, hold on. Where do I have that picture?
All right. All right, moving things around. As I've warned you guys before in this class, I am a bit of a tinkerer, so I do like messing with things, and sometimes even during lecture. So, Sorry, I messed this up, so hold on. Oop, oop. There we go, now it fits on the slide. All right, excellent. All right, so. Steepest pressure change is in the arteries, and again, blood pressure, especially in those elastic arteries, in the heart is pulsatile. We actually see this with this great chart here. Notice as we talked about blood pressure in the heart or in the aorta as it comes out of the heart can be as high as 120 millimeters of mercury. But notice that's only occurring when the heart is actually ejecting blood. So this is only when the uh, ventricle ejects blood, All right? As it is building up, as it is going down, that isometric contraction, the isovolumetric relaxation, all the way till it's relaxed. And when the ventricle is completely relaxed, that pressure is 80 millimeters of mercury. And so what happens is it fluctuates back and forth between the two. The ventricle contracts and it relaxes and it contracts and it relaxes and it contracts and it relaxes. And again, you can feel that pulsatile nature in those close blood vessels, like in your common carotid artery or things along those lines, where you feel the pulse uh, even in your brachial or your radial arteries. But as we talked about in the veins, the pressure is much, much less and it is uniform at that point. And we saw it also when you cut your finger. You see the squirting, if you cut an artery, you don't if you cut a vein. But notice also the differences in the pressures. It goes as high as 120 in the arteries and to the arterioles. And by the time we hit the capillaries, it's down to about 35. So the pressure change in the arteries is from 120 to 35. It's a massive pressure gradient. And that's why it flows very fast and why only a small amount of blood is in the arteries. Notice the capillary goes from about 35 to, as we talked about, to about 17. And then our pressure gradient in all of the veins, from the venules all the way back to the heart, is from 17 to zero. So it's a, isn't it? a very, very small pressure gradient change that we see there. In fact, if you look at it, the pressure gradient is 18 in the capillaries themselves and only 17 in all the veins. That's why it moves so slowly and so sluggishly through those veins because of those differences in pressure. Okay? All right, but pressure isn't the only thing that affects the flow of blood. Flow of blood is also inversely proportional to the resistance of our blood vessels. Resistance is basically the opposition of flow. And again, they're inversely proportional. So what that means is uh, flow equals one over resistance. So if we double the resistance of a blood vessel, what happens to our flow? Faster. You get smaller, how much smaller? If I double the resistance, what happens to the flow? Flow decreases by one half, right? One half, one over two, resistance. They're, they're inversely proportional. Whereas if by half the resistance, then flow doubles. Resistance is basically the friction that the blood runs into by rolling against, pushing against the walls of the blood vessel. All right. Now, there are three important factors that influence how much resistance is in a blood vessel. The blood viscosity, how thick and viscous, how much water is in the blood, how many cells are in the blood, things along those lines. Your total blood vessel length. 
right? For every, what, 10 pounds of weight you put on, you add an additional mile of blood vessels or something crazy like that. And the blood vessel diameter. Now, of these three factors, which ones are the most dynamic? Can your blood viscosity change from moment to moment? Oh. Not normally. I guess technically if you were to inject a massive amount of water or inject a massive amount of red blood cells into your blood, would it change the viscosity instantaneously? Yeah, absolutely. But is that something that normally happens during the course of the day? No. As we talked about, uh, gaining and losing weight can change the number of blood vessels you have, but how many people can add 10 pounds just in three minutes. I know it feels that way sometimes, but not usually, right? So of all of these factors, which is the only one that really can affect blood flow on an instant to instant uh, 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 status? Diameter. And as it turns out, the diameter of a blood vessel has a massive influence on our resistance. I'm gonna show you an equation here. I'm gonna tell you right now, you do not need to memorize this equation. I just want you to see it so that you understand it. The resistance of a blood vessel is equal to one over the radius of the blood vessel to the fourth power. All right, so let's think about this. If I, if I were to double the radius of a blood vessel. So the blood vessel has a radius of one centimeter and I double it to two centimeters. What effect does that have on the resistance? resistance. Well, it's gonna be, let's do the math. One over two to the fourth power. Where's my uh, power button? A little upside down thingy. Uh, I don't know how to do that here. Oh, well, doesn't matter. Um, like the upside down V. So it's not times four, it's to the fourth power where you do the little upside down V thing. I can't figure out how to do that on my keyboard, so I don't care. But you get the idea. So let's say this way, two. two Shift and six. To the fourth power. And what would that be? Well, two times two is four. four. Times two is? Eight. Eight times two is? 16. So it's 1 16th. So by just doubling the resistance, I mean by just doubling the radius, the resistance of our blood vessel is now 1 16th of what it was again. Or let's do the opposite. If we decrease it, you know, by half, if we just decrease the, resist the radius by half, that is going to increase the resistance 16 times. Like I said, I, you don't have to memorize this equation, but what I want you to appreciate is that even small changes in a diameter of a blood vessel can have a huge effect on the resistance and therefore a huge impact on the flow of our blood. So even small, subtle, dynamic changes, huge impact on resistance, which is gonna have a huge impact on the flow of our blood. All right? Mm -hmm. And so when we need to make dynamic changes in our blood pressure, dynamic changes in our blood flow, change in the diameter of those blood vessels is gonna allow us to do that. How can we do that? Because that's the other part that goes hand in hand with this, right? Our blood flow is affected by our blood pressure. Our blood pressure affects our blood flow. Well, I mean, how can we uh, change the diameter of the vessel? How do we change the diameter of blood vessel? That's a great question. How do we do that? Anybody know? If only we had a layer in it that can train a type of tissue that was contractile in nature and could change its overall length and size. Do we have something like that? You guys are overthinking this. How do I change the diameter of a blood vessel? With heat? Yeah, the smooth muscle in the tunica media. Remember, the tunica media is smooth muscle. If I contract that smooth muscle, my circular tunica media gets smaller and I've constricted the diameter or the resist or the radius. If I relax that smooth muscle, my blood vessel dilates. So I can change the size of my blood vessel by using that smooth muscle in the tunica media. 
what can cause uh, cause this um, change in the uh, cause Controlled? smooth muscle to do that? How do we control the smooth muscle of our of our blood vessels? The sympathetic nervous system, chemical signals like uh, adrenaline, other hormones, and by the sympathetic nervous system. Remember, our sympathetic nervous system is what controls our blood vessels. Remember, way back in 430, when we talked about the effects of you know, our sympathetic nervous system, we talked about how it constricts blood vessels to the skin, it constricts blood vessels to the digestive system, to the salivary glands, but it dilates the blood vessels going to the liver, going to the muscles, right? All those things. So we use chemical signals, we use uh, direct neural communication from our sympathetic nervous system to change the diameters, to send the blood where we need it to go. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. So we already talked about this. Blood pressure is the force of the blood pushing on the walls of the blood vessel. How many times it bangs against there? Typically, if we are taking someone's blood pressure, we do that uh, in a, uh, typically one of the large elastic arteries that are near the heart, like the brachial uh, artery is a common one, right? I don't recommend taking a blood pressure in the carotid. It is a nice large elastic artery, but why wouldn't you want to take a blood, rest, uh, blood pressure in, in the carotid arteries? You get choked out. Yeah, you'd have to put that blood pressure cuff around their neck, and that would not be a good thing, right? Absolutely, yeah, you would choke them out. Excellent. As we've already talked about, pressure is expressed in the millimeters of mercury, basically how far you can move a small amount of mercury, how, how many millimeters you can move that. So that is the typical uh, measurement we use for pressure. And again, like we said, those differences in the blood pressure is what moves the blood. And we talked about this here. We've already done that. We talked about those changes, so I don't have to do it again. But we do need to do some calculations here. One of the first things we need to do is we need to find out the mean arterial pressure. Notice we don't have to worry about a mean venous pressure because the pressure in the veins is consistent whether the ventricle is contracting or relaxing. Well, this is easy. I know how to do an average. The mean arterial pressure is just an average, so I need to tell the difference between when the ventricle is contracting and when the ventricle relaxes. And I know that when it's contracting, it gets up to 120, and when it relaxes, it's down to 80. So I know I need to add those two numbers together, 120 plus 80, and then I'm gonna divide that by two, because I have two numbers, and that is gonna give me a mean arterial pressure equal to 100 millimeters of mercury. Perfect. Questions on that? I'll ask it again. Questions on that? Not so far. Well. The way I did my calculation, it should be 100 millimeters of mercury. Is that what the chart says the mean arterial pressure is? Uh, a little bit lower. No, it doesn't. It's lower. Why? Isn't this how we figure out averages? In a perfect world. Well, let's think of it this way. You guys had the first test coming up. And let's say on the first test that every single person in this class gets a grade of 40 on the exam, except Nick. Nick gets 100. So if I want to figure out the average for this class, I take 100, I take 40, I add them together, divide it by two, and I come up with 70. Is 70 the average on the first exam? No. It's halfway between, it's halfway between 100 and 40. So what's the problem with that? It's not proportionate. It's not proportionate. Remember, these two pressures, when the ventricle is contracting, and really it's more than that, it's when the ventricle is ejecting blood, the pressure is 120. But if you think of the cardiac cycle, is the, blood, is the, is the ventricle ejecting blood half of the time and the other half of the time it is not? No. No, it's only ejecting blood for a very short period of time. 
So while you have these two values, 120 and 80, they're not spending equal amount of time during those pressures, during those acts. And so that's why that doesn't work out that way. Luckily, we have an easy way to calculate the mean arterial pressure. All you need is your cardiac output. Remind me again what your cardiac output was. How do you calculate cardiac output? Heart rate times stroke volume. All right, heart rate. Can everybody figure out their heart rate? Do I need to take 15 seconds so you can all count your heart rate and multiply it by two and give it to me? Could we do that? Super simple, excellent. So heart rate times what? Stroke volume. Stroke volume. How many people here know their stroke volume? That's a little bit trickier. Okay, well, so maybe cardiac output isn't as easy to calculate. But luckily, we all know the absolute resistance of all the blood vessels in our body right now at this moment in time, right? How many people know how much resistance is in your blood vessels right now at this moment in time? Anybody? Okay, well, nobody. Great. So this is a horrible way to try to calculate it. That stinks. Well, luckily, there is an easier way. And that easier way is to actually take your diastolic blood pressure and, multiply, and add it to one third of your pulse pressure. Of course, to do this, we have to figure out what a pulse pressure is. So what is the pulse pressure? Anyone know? What is the pulse pressure? Yeah, how hard your heart's contracting? Or your ventricle? Oh, that, that's actually kind of partially correct. What is, it deals with the pressure it's though. Anybody know what the pulse pressure is? The difference uh, between systolic and diastolic blood pressure. There you go. Yeah. It is the difference between the systolic and the diastolic pressures. So that's much easier to calculate. For our set here, our diastolic is 80. To that, we are going to multiply one third of our or one third of our pulse pressure, which would be 120 minus 80. 120 minus 80 is what? 40. 40. 40. One third of 40 is? Um, well, it's about, well, you figure out it's about 13, 13.3. Right, so 80 plus 14, 13 plus three? 93.3. All right, absolutely excellent is gonna equal 93.3. Now, while I don't expect you to be able to calculate your cardiac output and your resistance, can you figure out your mean arterial pressure if you know your systolic and your diastolic? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. This pulse pressure isn't just used to calculate our average arterial pressure. It can be a very important number in other ways too, especially with older people. Older people, when they tend to have less elasticity in their arteries, often it is the difference between the systolic and the diastolic number that is actually more important than the actual numbers themselves. How different is the pressures in their blood vessels when, it's the, when the ventricle is ejecting blood versus when it is at rest is often a more significant number for those individuals than the actual numbers themselves. So pulse pressure, the differences between those two pressures uh, can be an important number in and of itself as well but we can also use it to calculate the mean arterial pressure. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. So now we know how to calculate the mean arterial pressure. We've talked about the pulsatile nature in the arteries and how the pressure change leads to that flow of blood. So the only thing we need to do then to fully make sense of this is be able to take a blood pressure. You need to be able to take a blood pressure to be able to do all these calculations. And what is the instrument you use to measure a blood pressure with? Sigmometer. There you go, excellent. Not a cuff, you're not gonna get away with blood pressure cuff on this exam. I guarantee at some point you are going to have to spell sigmo manometer. Sigmo manometer or sigmo manometer. Sigmo manometer is how most people say it, but I, Again, because I'm a poor speller, I always think it's Sigmo manometer because that's, that's how it's spelled and that's what I care about on the exam. I don't care how you pronounce it. 
uh, that absolutely, right? And how does that work? Someone explain to me what it is, how you use a blood pressure cuff, how you use a SIGO uh, nanometer. Well, listening with your stethoscope. Okay. Is that, the, is that the answer you're looking for? Sort of, but why? So yeah. I, you absolutely have it right. So here's what we do. Let's let's work our way through this. Isn't we it have an arm. There's our arm. And inside of this arm is a blood vessel. Brachial. Yeah, like the brachial artery. Excellent. So we have this brachial artery that is flowing through it. We then, as you mentioned, put the blood pressure cuff of the sigma manometer on the outer surface of the arm. Let's go ahead and make that green. And then you pump it up with pressure, as you mentioned. You fill it with air. And as you fill it with air, it increases the pressure. Right? And what happens when you increase this cuff with, plesh, with pressure? It cuts off the circulation of the brachial so you can feel the pressure when it releases. Excellent. Your goal is to actually fill it up with enough air where it is actually going to produce a pressure that is going to collapse the blood vessel. So our goal at first is to increase the pressure to collapse the blood vessel. The artery, right? Hmm? The artery. Yes, the artery, yeah, specifically the artery. You're using the stethoscope to listen for when, uh, was it when you're releasing the air, you're listening, using the stethoscope to hear when uh, it finally, was it when the blood pressure uh, is greater than the cuff, correct? Right, absolutely. So let's think, again, let's say this is a normal, typical healthy person with a systolic of 120 and a diastolic of 80, okay? So in this blood vessel, in this brachial artery, when the ventricle is ejecting blood, the pressure goes up to 120. When it's at rest, it drops down to 80. So we need to fill this pressure, and usually you fill the pressure up to about 180, you know, 200, somewhere around that range. You don't want to go much more than that, otherwise you're going to hurt somebody. And then you guys are correct. What you do is you take that stethoscope, and you put the stethoscope down here in the elbow so that you can basically, oops, listen down here for the movement of blood. And then, as you guys pointed out, you are going to slowly release the pressure. From 180 to 170, to 160, to 150, to 130, to 120, to 119. If the pressure now in the cuff is, let's say, 119, now notice when the ventricle is ejecting blood, the pressure in the artery is greater than the pressure in the cuff. When the heart is ejecting blood is greater than the cuff. And what happens is that inflates the blood vessel. Blood can enter now the blood vessel. Now, when it enters the blood vessel, is it going to enter it really smoothly? No. 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 When it does it, it produces a lot of turbulence. And that turbulence you hear as this whooshing sound. So the first time that blood enters into the blood vessel and you hear that whooshing sound, you look at what your pressure is on the cuff. And that tells you the pressure at which blood was able to enter, and that tells you your systolic. But then as soon as the blood stops getting ejected from the heart, then the pressure drops and the blood vessel collapses again. And then the heart pumps it out and it fills and it collapses, and it fills and it collapses. And as the pressure slowly drops, it keeps filling and collapsing, producing that whooshing sound, producing that turbulence. However, once the pressure in the cuff reaches, for this example, 79 millimeters of mercury, what happens then? You don't hear it anymore. Yeah, at that point, the cuff can't collapse the blood vessel anymore. 
And if the blood vessel can't collapse anymore, then blood is gonna smoothly move through it. We can no longer collapse the blood vessel. And because of that, there's no more turbulence. And the whooshing stops. So when you hear the whooshing stop, you again look at your dial, see what that number is, and that gives you your diastolic. So when we use the sphygmo manometer, uh, we're listening for the first, uh, the first sound of the blood, and then we're listening for the last sound of the blood while watching the dial, correct? Correct. Because one of the tricks of the dial, and for those of you who have done it, you'll know this, what will happen is as the dial starts to come down, you will actually see a deflection of the arrow. The, the, the needle will deflect with the increase in pressure, and it, it, it deflects with the pumping of the blood. So what will happen is you'll see a deflection, and you'll see a deflection, but that's why you listen. It's not when you see the deflection, it's when you hear the whoosh. So what will happen is you'll see deflection, see deflection, and then you'll see a deflection, and during that deflection, you hear the whoosh. So then you'll go whoosh, 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 whoosh. And then again, you'll continue to see those deflections, but it's not the deflections you're paying attention to, it's the sounds that you hear. Just out of curiosity, what's the name of those whooshing sounds? Is it like lub dub where it's just called whoosh? Brought cough sounds. There you go, excellent. They are the cotter cough sounds. Cotter cough sounds are that whooshing sound that you use your sphygmo monometer to be able to differentiate, to tell the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure. And then of course, once you have those, you can calculate your pulse pressure, which would also allow you to calculate your mean arterial pressure. And if you didn't like my illustration, here's the pretty picture from the textbook that shows this process as well. All righty, questions on that? All right, excellent. Just that easily then, that is everything that I wanted to talk about. Oh, actually, we'll do this real quickly first. So, and again, I gave you fake numbers earlier, but what is, and again, I, I am fully aware I am painting this with incredibly broad strokes. The sky doesn't get any bluer than this. I know it seems like almost weekly they're changing the parameters and what they consider hypertensive and prehypertensive and everything else that goes along with this. So this is very, very broad strokes that I'm drawing with here. And also age makes a huge difference. Again, we could spend the rest of the class time talking about blood pressure if we wanted to. I just don't know why we would. But typically, the normal range is considered with a systolic between uh, 100 and 140 and a diastolic between 60 and 80. Hypotension is typically considered a systolic below 100, but even that can be tricky. A even a small drop in blood pressure of as little as 20 millimeters of mercury can cause hypotension, right? If you think back to middle school, when you were in middle school, right back in fifth grade, it was a lot harder to get a hold of alcohol. And so if you had trouble getting some uh, alcohol that evening, what would you do instead? Well, you'd ball yourself up into a ball sitting in a ball-like shape on the ground, tight as possible, and then you would jump up and stand up straight as quickly as possible. Why would you do that? Or what would happen when you did that? That makes you out. Yeah, well, okay, hopefully you don't go so far as passing out, but it certainly will make you very dizzy, right? That orthostatic hypotension, that change of position that causes that minor drop in, in pressure. It happens sometimes when you've been laying on the bed and suddenly you have to get up really quickly. You sit up too quickly. You can get a little lightheaded for a second just from that small drop in pressure because what's happened is while you're laying down vertically, your heart doesn't have to work as hard to pump the blood to your brain. But as soon as you stand up, it has to pump the blood against gravity and it takes it a second to compensate for that because it wasn't ready. And so you get a teeny bit lightheaded for that small change. And like I said, the parameters of this change dramatically almost daily, but for simple terms, hypertension is often referred to as a systolic above 140 and a diastolic above 90. But again, there's prehypertension and all sorts of other uh, conditions and things along those lines. And we'll talk about that more in the next class. All right. Questions on that? 
All right, that is everything I wanted to talk about for lecture. Uh, I do uh, want to finish lecture a little bit early because we didn't get as far into the blood vessel anatomy as I wanted to last time. So I want to make sure that we can try to get through as much of that as possible because it's due on Tuesday. So this will be a good stopping point for the lecture. Let's go ahead and take our last break and then we will come back and we will do our blood pressure anatomy. All right, any questions on that? All right, my clock says 2.25, so let's come back at 2.40, and at 2.40 we will restart from there, and I will start the recording at that point as well. All righty, I will see you guys in 15 minutes. All righty. Any questions before we dive into where we left off? Excellent. All right, so uh, we left off last time and we had just finished talking about this large anastomosis, the circle of Willis in our brain region. And we had talked about the blood flow to that area. We also talked about that, and we don't have to go through all that again. We had talked about those three branches that come, oops, there we go, that come off of the aortic arch, the brachiocephalic, which branches to form the a right common carotid and the right subclavian. And as we talked about from that point, the right and the left are identical on their sides. So as you're giving those driving directions, for instance, to uh, the left side of your head versus the right side of the head, they're completely symmetrical with the exception of if you're going to the left, you have to go through the brachiocephalic first. So as we talked about uh, for the, um, Left common carotid, it becomes the left internal and ext internal. The left subclavian goes to the axial brachial and everything else. So again, we have that symmetry that we talked about that way. So, and again, as we left off last time, we were talking about how the aortic arch uh, has three blood vessels that come off of it, but go to four different parts of the body. The left arm, the right arm, the left side of the head, and the right side of the head. And so we've done all of that. Um, <clears throat> and the vertebral, and then also the internal uh, thoracic that we saw here. Now, remember also, as we talked about, we can refer to the rest of the aorta as just the descending aorta, because it descends behind the heart, so it is posterior and inferior to the heart. However, as we also talked about, it is more meaningful to divide it actually into two pieces, based on that anatomical feature that is the uh, diaphragm. So that the port that is above the diaphragm is the thoracic aorta, and the part below it is the abdominal aorta. And then ultimately, the abdominal aorta terminates, and when it terminates, it forms three blood vessels. And anyone know? what the three blood vessels that are formed by the abdominal aorta when it terminates? Somebody give me one of them. My speaker's on, right? My, my uh, microphone's on, you guys yes. are hearing me? Excellent. The left common, common carotid, brachiocephalic, and left subclavian. So that's the aortic arch. What I'm talking about is the abdominal aorta. The abdominal aorta at the end, right? When the aorta ends, so down here it comes down and it terminates, there are actually three blood vessels that it branches and forms when it ends. So what are those three blood vessels? Somebody give me one of them. Common iliac artery. Okay, and you get partial credit for that, but what are you missing on that? Right or left. Right. So right. Okay common iliac. And so then what's the second one? Left common iliac. Left common. Iliac. And what's the third? The inferior mesenteric. Not a bad guess, but no, not the inferior mesenteric. The medial sacral. There you go. Excellent. Excellent. The median sacral blood vessel. And we'll take a look, closer look at that when we get to the abdomen in just a minute. Before we get to the abdomen, because there's a lot going on in the abdomen, there's not a lot going on in the thoracic cavity. 
Notice here in the thoracic cavity, there really aren't too many major blood vessels that come off the thoracic aorta. There are the posterior intercostal arteries that come off here. And remember coming off of the uh, subclavian is that internal thoracic, which feeds the anterior intercostals. But notice both the anterior intercostal and the posterior intercostals just feed the ribs. What about everything else in the thoracic cavity? Doesn't everything else in the thoracic cavity need blood? Yeah. Yeah, well, what are the things in the thoracic cavity? What are the big structures in the thoracic cavity? Heart. Heart. And doesn't the heart have its own uh, circulation system coming yeah. off the ascending aorta and all that? So, yes, yeah, so that's why there's not surprising it's not coming off the aorta. What else? The lungs. Lungs. And the lungs have their own blood supply as well, right? The pulmonary circulation, right? So, notice there aren't any big major blood vessels that are coming off here because there really aren't any big structures that aren't already getting their blood. That's the other reason why I think it's useful to talk about the difference between the thoracic aorta and the abdominal aorta. Because while there's not a whole lot going on here in the thoracic aorta, there is a whole heck of a lot going off here off of the abdominal aorta. All right. Now, this can be a little intimidating when we look at this. So let's cheat and go back to it and draw this. Mm, hold on. Red. All right, here is our abdominal aorta, and I'll totally cheat by doing that and doing that. Excellent. That will allow me to draw our diaphragm up here. So that's our diaphragm. And as you guys have already told me, we know down here, the abdominal aorta is going to branch into not one, not two, but three blood vessels coming out of this. And as we mentioned, they are the left uh, common iliac, the right common iliac, and down the middle here, the median sacral, which feeds the sacrum uh, and the coccyx. Excellent. So, as we work our way down from superior to inferior, I want you to identify the blood vessels for me. And the first thing I want you to tell me is if they are paired or unpaired. So not only do we need to identify the blood vessels, but we need to identify whether they're paired or they're unpaired. So as we move inferior of the diaphragm, what is the first blood vessel that we run into? What is, the, oh, hold on, I want that to stay big. So what's the first blood vessel? Again, I don't have the picture here, but you can look at a picture and cheat. What is the first blood vessel? Is it the left inferior phrenic? No. no. There we go, celiac trunk. Celiac trunk. Is it a paired or unpaired blood vessel? Unpaired. Paired. Excellent. So it is a single blood vessel that comes off of here, right off the middle. And it is a trunk. What does that tell us? It branches. Yeah, it's short and it branches almost immediately. And when it branches, how many branches does it form? Two. Just two? I heard two, I heard three, which one's correct? Well, three. Three, excellent. Three branches. What are the three branches? Common hepatic artery, splenic artery, and left gastric, gastric artery. Okay. 
Excellent. And let's take it one more step. Where do you think the common hepatic artery goes? To the liver. Liver. Where does the splenic artery go? Mm -hmm. Spleen. Excellent. That's convenient. And where do you think the left gastric artery goes? Stomach. 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 And not just the stomach, but the left side of the stomach. Right. Don't we need to feed blood to the right side of the stomach? Yes. Yeah, any idea where that right gastric artery comes off of? Right off of the uh, the abdominal uh, aorta? Nope, doesn't come straight off the abdominal aorta. Doesn't come off the spleen, Ooh. although that's a good guess. Hepatic, um, yeah. Hepatic thing? Hepatic portal? There you go. Off of the common hepatic artery is where we actually get the right uh, gastric. Artery. Excellent. Perfect. So now we got some idea of where those things go. And uh, let's go ahead and draw them like this. So we got one, and we got two, and we got three blood vessels that come off this celiac trunk. Excellent. As we descend uh, from that celiac, what is the next blood vessel that comes off of the Abdominal aorta. Superior mesenteric. Excellent. Is it paired or unpaired? Paired. Paired? Do we have two superior no. mesenteric arteries? No. Unpaired. Excellent. We have a second. Oops. Didn't want to do that. We have a second unpaired blood vessel. And the second unpaired blood vessel is the superior mesenteric. Now, of course, with a name like superior mesenteric, what does that likely mean we also have? Inferior. An inferior. inferior mesenteric, but not here. So we have that superior mesenteric. It is unpaired. And where does it go? To the lumbar. No, not necessarily the lumbar. Middle colic artery. Yeah, to the intestines, uh, to the small intestine, and the proximal part of the large intestine. So it feeds our intestinal arteries. And it goes off that way. Excellent. All right, as we continue to descend, what's next? Renal arteries? Renal. Renal arteries, excellent. Paired or unpaired? Paired. Paired, Paired. excellent. Paired. We have two renal arteries. Why do we have two renal arteries? We have two kidneys. We have two kidneys, exactly, and that's exactly where these go. These go to the kidneys. These are typically very large blood vessels, because as we've talked about before, when you're sitting here at rest, about 25% of your blood is being directed to your kidneys to be filtered and processed. Excellent. What's inferior to the renal arteries? Gonadal artery. Say again? Gonadal artery. Go Excellent. Next are the gonadal arteries, and I think your key was in what you said right there, arteries. So are, is it paired or unpaired? Paired. Paired, excellent. Where do the gonadal arteries go? Gonads. There you go, to the gonads. What are gonads? Testicles. There you go, excellent. So okay, if, if you're a boy type person, these are the testes. And oh. if you're a girl <laughs> type person, these are the ovaries. Excellent. And so there are indeed testicular arteries and ovarian arteries, depending on what type of person you are. Uh, and is there a difference, do you think, between these blood vessels? Um, maybe. One's longer, one's shorter? Yeah, which one's longer? Male. Yeah, testicular arteries are longer. Why? Because that's external. Oh, not really. Right. Because shorter. the testicles are located outside of the abdominal pelvic cavity. 
whereas the ovaries are nestled up inside of the uh, uh, abdominal pelvic cavity. So that's a big difference. What about any other difference between them? What about the overall metabolism? Is the metabolism the same in the ovaries versus the testes? No, no the testes take a little bit more. Yeah, testes are more metabolically active, absolutely, right? Think about this. How many gametes does a female make during the course of a week? Not as many as male. How many? One. Zero. <laughs> how, many, how many gametes does a female make in a year? Zero. 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 They're born with it. Yeah, they're born with them. She matures them. She does mature them, but how many of those gametes actually reach full maturity during the course of a month? One. One. Mm -hmm. Right? There you go. How many gametes does a male make in an hour? Thousands. Thousands of thousands, absolutely. Uh, we are so metabolically active making gametes. Quite frankly, I don't know why we're required to do anything else. We should just be able to just sit and make gametes because it is so metabolically active, absolutely. So not surprisingly, the testicular arteries are going to be larger and longer because there's more of a metabolic need to the testes, whereas the typically the ovaries and ones are shorter and smaller, but they are both paired uh, um, arteries that come directly off of the abdominal aorta. All right. Any others? Anything inferior to the gonadals? Inferior mesenteric artery. And is it paired or unpaired? Unpaired. unpaired. There you go. Anytime we have a superior something, we likely have an inferior one uh, artery, and it is unpaired. Oh, that reminds me, I saw a uh, question. The middle suprarenal arteries, we do have those, but again, they don't come off the abdominal aorta. And more importantly, they're not blood vessels you're responsible for. So you don't have to worry about those. Because again, remember, we're not responsible for all the blood vessels on our um, list, just the, uh, just the ones that are, I mean, all the blood vessels in the body, just the ones that are on the list. There you go, excellent. Um, where does the inferior mesenteric go? Mesenteric. Right. Well, yeah, to the mesenteries. And remember, the mesenteries, remember, are those double membranes, do double layers of serous membrane that go to the intestine. So primarily, this one goes to the distal part of the large intestine. And again, goes to intestinal arteries. Arteries. Excellent. So we have that there. And again, it is unpaired. So just that simply, and actually uh, there's a, a, a schematic to this on your, uh, in your um, modules that I found that did this. So here we've done it with the pretty picture this way. But if we go back to the pretty picture in your textbook, we can see all of these things as well. So notice, and I'll use the highlighter so I don't have to cover up anything like this. We see that single trunk that is the celiac trunk that has the one, two, three branches coming off of it our superior mesenteric, the two renals. Now, I know someone mentioned the suprarenals that come off of it, but again, remember those aren't on your list, so we don't have to worry about that. The gonadal, inferior mesenteric, and then it terminates at the two common iliacs and the median sacral. Notice, I also like this picture from your textbook that shows us where some of these things go. Notice here our celiac trunk goes to the common hepatic, which also feeds into here. Let's actually, that's confusing. Um, common hepatic, which feeds into the right gastric, left gastric, and the splenic comes off and sneaks over here to the spleen. We see, it, oh, actually it sneaks out this way. We're gonna do it move this way to come that way there. Here, we see how the inferior mesenteric is going to the large intestine, while the superior mesenteric is going to the small intestine and the proximal part of the large intestine. Uh, notice it doesn't show us the renal or the gonadal, but it shows us these ones associated with the digestive system. The other thing that your book has that I really, really like 
and this really helps with your driving directions, is it has these great schematics. Um, where are those? Page 730. 730, is that one of those? Yeah, although they're all over the place. 7.30, I'm sure, has got one. Ooh, here's, I like this one. Uh, mine's not 7.30 on that page, but for instance, uh, look if you look at page 7.42, right, it's got the picture that goes along with it, but notice they've got this great schematic. It kind of moves that pesky uh, arm out of the way, and it kind of does everything at right angles to each other. So it does a nice job of showing these great schematics and flow charts of how the blood moves through these blood vessels. So it's really, really nice that way. Oh, my, my pages are different because it's a different edition. Okay, well then that's fine too. Yep. All right, excellent. And again, so that's a little wonky in there. I wanted to talk some about that. Like I said, the leg is pretty straightforward. Although the one thing I did want to point out because we talked about it today, notice again here, they point at just this single thing as the popliteal artery. But again, notice we see this elaborate anastomosis around the knee. So as we talked about, no matter how the knee is bent, blood is gonna be able to flow through that knee region to be able to get to the lower part of the leg. So it's a great example of where we see a really elaborate network of arteries to make sure that no matter what position your knee is in, blood is gonna get through that. All right, and again, it goes all through that. I'm not gonna waste time on that. All right, so those are our arteries. And again, I don't, we didn't go through everything, but I wanted to hit some of the key parts. Same thing with the veins, especially in those areas where there's some asymmetries. So when we look at the veins, one of the things we notice about our uh, cranial cavity is our cranial cavity has a massive numbers of this fancy thing we talked about before. And that fancy thing, of course, is a sinus. And what did we say a sinus was again? An opening of the of air. Yeah, it's a big loose vein to be able to make it very easy to accumulate and collect blood. Why might it be important to have a lot of sinuses in the cranial cavity? Makes the head lighter. Don't want fluid. Yeah, we want to drain the head as easily as possible. Why? you don't want fluid build up in the head. Right, you want to avoid edema, right? Edema is really the key, right? If you uh, get swelling in your hand, right? It gets a little uncomfortable when you have to, you know, flex your fingers or things like that. Like I said, it gets hard to get that ring off when you get to the bar on Friday night, but it's not going to be debilitating, right? But what about up here in your cranial cavity? Do you want swelling, accumulation, edema occurring within that region? No, not at all. No, absolutely not. So we want to make it as easy as possible. We learned about some of these in 430 when we were talking about our dura matter. If you remember, within our dura matter, uh, there are the double layers of fibrous connective tissues. And in some regions, it separated and came off, helping to form, like, for instance, the falx cerebri or the falx cerebelli or the tentorum cerebelli. And in those regions, when the two layers separated, they formed big, massive sinuses. And probably the best example of that was this one right here. Right up at the top, right on the midline of the body, is that superior sagittal sinus. And I think I have to erase that now because I've highlighted it there. That superior sagittal sinus is found right in the midline, right in that falx cerebri. And of course, anytime you have a superior something, what else are you going to have? Inferior. An inferior something. Excellent. So we have that inferior sagittal sinus. And I'll do it this way. I'll highlight these. So here's the superior sagittal sinus. Here's the inferior sagittal sinus. Notice that inferior sagittal sinus feeds into the straight sinus. The straight sinus is actually located in the tutorum cerebelli, that piece of uh, dura matter that separates the cerebrum from the cerebellum. Uh, if we cheat, here, hold on, let me see if I can find a quick example of this. I think, if I remember correctly,
Here we go. This will work. Yep, strong button. Where did you all go? There you are. I found you. You have been saved. All right, excellent. Here we go. This I found uh, really quickly, super quickly, from that virtual anatomy lab from CRC. Here, this is primarily involved in brain stuff and brain anatomy, but notice as we look at this half head chart, and the half head models will show this the same way. Notice up here in the dura mater, we see that big superior uh, sagittal sinus. And then here we see that straight sinus that is in the tentorum cerebelli. So we actually see those really, really nicely on a half head model or on a half head chart like this. So we can see those nicely there. Um, the other place you, uh, so, okay, so we have those three, so let's go over them again. I'll highlight them again. Superior sagittal sinus, inferior sagittal sinus, which feeds into the straight sinus. These both feed into the sigmoid sinus, which is this S-shaped sinus that feeds into the internal jugular. The same way that the internal carotid feeds the inside of the, the skull, the brain, the internal jugular receives its blood from inside the skull. And not surprisingly, it is a big, large, loose blood vessel, much bigger, much larger than the external jugular, which just drains the superficial blood vessels. There are two other important sinuses. One is the cavernous sinus. This cavernous sinus is located kind of posterior to the orbit of the eye, posterior to the maxilla, plays an important role in draining blood from the face and eye region and collecting it, feeding it into the sigmoid uh, sinus. And this model doesn't show it uh, very well, but if we looked at it from the top, if we did a top view of the skull, let's kind of cheat and do it this way. So if we were looking at this head from the top, we would have that superior sagittal sinus that's right on the midline, and then the inferior would be right on the midline, and the sigmoid would be straight would be, and the sigmoid would be right on the midline. All of these would be right on the midline. Even the cavernous would be right on the midline. But there are two lateral sinuses that help drain the lateral aspect. And that was a horrible job of drawing that one there. Any idea what these lateral sinuses might be? These sinuses to the side? The right and left transverse sinus? There you go. Those are the right and left, right, let me try that again. Right and left transverse sinuses. So we have all these big, huge sinuses in the cranial cavity to make it as efficient as possible to get the blood out of the brain and get it into the internal jugular. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. So like we said, the external jugular comes out from inside the skull, pardon me, internal jugular comes from the inside of the skull, external jugular comes from the outside, draining the superficial. The jugulars meet up with the sub axial and subclavian, and when you have the veins from the arm and the veins from the head coming together, what blood vessel do you form? The superior vena cava. Before the superior vena cava. Brachiocephalic. Brachiocephalic, because the blood vessels of the head and the arm, or more specifically, the arm and the head, form the brachiocephalic vein. How many brachiocephalic arteries did we have? Three. Brachiocephalic arteries. Uh, one. Two. One. How many brachiocephalic Five. veins do we have? Two. 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 We have a, so with the brachiocephalic veins, you need to make sure you specify right or left. With the artery, you don't have to because you only have one. But the veins, you have two. With the veins from the arm, from the jugulars, you have complete symmetry. So again, if you're that plumber who did the piping for this, why you needed that extra tubing for the arteries and not for the veins, I don't have an answer for you. But we have two brachiocephalic veins, but only one brachiocephalic artery. All right. And then of course, as I mentioned, those two brachiocephalic 
uh, veins feed into the superior vena cava, which feeds into the right atrium. Draining both sides of the head and arm. Now, we have mostly symmetry in the arms. So again, we have brachial, we have axillary, we have uh, subclavian, we have all of those things that we talked about, radial and ulnar, and all the things that go along with that. But there are two other, they're same on the right and the left. Oh wait, where is this, this, this model doesn't show it. Okay, uh, hold on. Let us erase this for a second. Actually, I can't clear any of that, can I? Dang it, all right. So, Notice it's pointing at these deep vessels, but let's instead take a look at this one and this one. Any idea what these two are called? Let's start first. What is this lateral blood vessel called? What is this lateral blood vessel of the vein, this lateral vein called? Cephalic vein, no? Say again? Cephalic vein. Exactly. Because as we know, cephalic means what? Brain. Well, it means head. It means and head. so having a cephalic vein over here on your arm makes all the sense in the world, right? No, it's no, because so of how we, when we were born. Exactly. Developmentally, as we are developing from that little tadpole into a person, as the arm bud grows, what ends up happening is that arm bud grows kind of up here next to the head. And so this superficial vein, which is right next to the head, is called the cephalic vein. Whereas then this one, the medial one that's furthest away from it, is known as the... Basilic. 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 Notice not basilar. Basilar was in the brain. This is basilic. This is... Oops. because it's the base, it's a way. And again, that cephalic and basilic names come from uh, when the blood vessel, when the arm is really growing as an arm bud. So that's where they get those names. And notice there's a lot more anastomoses. You have your median cubital and some other things because we want those multiple routes to get back in the arm. All right, those are the two, especially cephalic that I wanted to talk about because it seems like such an odd name for a blood vessel. All right. Um, Here's another one of those interesting anatomical asymmetries that we see in the thoracic cavity. Blood from all of those intercostal blood vessels that we feed into are going to obviously feed back into the superior vena cava. And they do that uh, from the right side by this blood vessel right here. This blood vessel right here that runs the entire length of the right side and receives blood from all of the right side of the thoracic cavity is what is known as the azygous vein. And notice this azygous vein actually feeds into the superior vena cava. So there are actually three blood vessels that feed into the superior vena cava. The right brachiocephalic vein, the left brachiocephalic vein, and the azygous vein. So the same way there are three blood vessels that feed into the right atrium, there are three blood vessels that feed into the superior vena cava. But then something interesting happens over here on the left. Over here on the left, we have this blood vessel that pretty much runs the length of the thoracic cavity, and then it gets about halfway up and it gets tired. He goes, you know what, I don't want to have to carry all this blood back to the heart myself, so I'll just give it to the zygus. This one happens to run about half the length of the zygus before it gives up and gives its blood to the zygus. So guess what we call this blood vessel on the left that only goes halfway up? Hemiozygous. The hemiozygous vein. Of course, that means the hemiozygous needs some help to do its job. So to do its job, it needs a little help in the form of a blood vessel that can drain the superior part of the left thoracic cavity and feed it into the azygous. So our hemiozygous needs some help, and it gets that help from? Accessory hemiozygous. The accessory hemiozygous. 
So notice uh, on the posterior part in the venous structures, there's this asymmetry where you just have one blessed vessel, the azygous that drains the right, and two, the hemiazygous and accessory hemiazygous that drain the left. And if that wasn't wonky enough for you, let's take a look at what happens in the abdominal pelvic cavity. All right, so any questions on this before we move to the abdominal pelvic cavity? Remind me again, how many blood vessels came off of the abdominal aorta? Three. How many blood vessels came off of the abdominal oh. aorta? Three. Abdominal. Oh. Seven that we're responsible for, right? Mm -hmm. Celiac trunk, superior mesenteric, two renals, two gonadals, and an inferior mesenteric. Seven. Right. Yeah. So that must mean that there's seven that feed into the inferior vena cava, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm asking the question, so what's the obvious answer? No, yeah. the obvious answer is absolutely no. So let's take a look at it. Notice a big, huge lack of blood vessels that come off of, uh, into, feed into the inferior vena cava. Now, not surprisingly, we have the obvious ones. The obvious ones are, of course, the common iliac vein. I don't like how the green shows up. Let's use dark red. The com right and left common iliacs that feed into it. We even have a median sacral vein, although I don't remember if that one's on your list or not. But look at the last rest of this. We have our two renal, renal veins, and we have our hepatic veins. Hepatic veins, of course, get blood from what? Where does the hepatic veins drain blood from into the inferior vena cava? From the liver. Excellent. Oops. And of course, where do the renal veins get their blood from? Kidney. All right. Oops. Kidneys. Excellent. But notice no superior mesenteric, no inferior mesenteric. And even our gonadals are wonky. Let's take a look at this. Look at our gonadals here for a second. Notice we have, change colors here, the right gonadal vein that feeds into the inferior vena cava, just as we had the right gonadal artery that came off of the abdominal aorta. But where's the left gonadal vein? On the renal vein? Yeah, notice the left gonadal vein, rather than going directly to the inferior vena cava, actually feeds into the left renal and only indirectly feeds into the inferior vena cava. Why is that the case? No, I'm really asking why, because I want to know, because I have no idea. You know, again, Obviously, why is one of those super challenging questions to answer in, a, in anatomy and physiology? Because as I've said many times, the engineer who designed all this did not leave us her footnotes, right? But often we can kind of guess at or we can kind of reason at as engineers or as plumbers or things like that, why things might be the way they are. But why, yeah. this, why this asymmetry? I have absolutely no clue. Is there an embryological development reason? No idea. Honestly, I have no idea. I, I, I have no idea. I don't even have a good, I don't even have a good, you know, wild hair guess at why it might be. So it just is. It's just weird, but it is. It's like, All right? it's like the same idea from the thoracic cavity where uh, we have this hemi. Yeah, hemi the left side is wonky, the right side. Maybe that's why it is. Left is evil, as we all know, and right is good. Maybe that's what it is. I don't know. I don't have a good answer. So we have this weirdness of the gonadal, but we still have this issue with the abdominal. Where the heck 
are the abdominal veins. Why are we not seeing any veins associated with the digestive system on this picture? Why aren't they feeding into the inferior vena cava? They're feeding into the liver, aren't they? Exactly. Absolutely. In the vena structure, and there's the magic word I was looking for, although close, you got to be careful, Alexa, the close. All blood vessels from the digestive system. Notice not only do we have not have the small intestine or the large intestine, but notice the stomach, right? The spleen, all of these things, all of the blood vessels from the digestive system feed into a blood vessel called the hepatic portal vein. The hepatic portal vein and the hepatic veins are not the same thing. So what happens is you have all of the digestive blood vessels. They feed into the hepatic portal vein. Actually, let's do it this way. I like it this way better. They are going to feed into the hepatic portal vein. And that hepatic portal vein feeds into the liver. And there, inside the liver, magic happens. And after that magic happens, the blood leaves the liver into the hepatic vein. And that hepatic vein feeds into the inferior vena cava. So why? What's the magic that happens? Why take this weird alternate route to bring the blood back? Filtration. Exactly. I know every single person here in this class listening is a little confused by this because every single person in this class for every single meal that they have, have a perfectly balanced meal with the right amount of carbohydrates and the right amount of proteins and the right amount of lipids and the right amount of macromolecules and a completely well-balanced circular meal. But some people have a donut and diet Coke for breakfast. And so what that means is the blood from your digestive system that is absorbing all those nutrients, when it gets it, it is very nutrient rich. But nutrient rich doesn't necessarily mean nutrient appropriate. Maybe you have too much glucose. Maybe you don't have enough magnesium, things along those lines. So this nutrient rich blood goes to the liver where that magic happens, and we'll worry about what the magic is when we get to the digestive system. But that magic happens, and what happens is it makes our blood nutrient appropriate. Where it has the right amount of nutrients. If there's excess of stuff, the liver stores it. If there's not enough of stuff, the liver secretes it. Making that blood nutrient appropriate, and then that nutrient appropriate blood can go back to the inferior vena cava, go back to the heart, and be distributed throughout the body. We don't see it with this view of the digestive, I mean, of the abdominal pelvic cavity, but if we go here, come on, where is it? There we go. Notice here, we see the intestinal veins, we see the inferior mesenteric artery, the superior mesenteric artery, the splenic artery, the left and right, gap, um, pardon me, veins, veins, all these veins intestinal veins, uh, uh, superior mesenteric, inferior mesenteric veins, splenic vein, uh, gastric veins, all of these feed into the hepatic portal vein, which feeds into the liver. Magic happens, and then after that magic happens, it leaves via the hepatic veins into the inferior vena cava. So that's why it's so, so different. The veins are so, so different from the arteries in our abdominal pelvic cavity.
All right. Questions on that? All right, again, the leg veins are pretty much identical to the leg uh, arteries with two big exceptions. Those two big exceptions is we have the express route. The express route is this large blood vessel that pretty much goes up the medial aspect of the leg from the foot all the way up and feeds in to the femoral vein. And that is the great saphenous vein. The great saphenous vein is the longest vein in the body. And anytime we have a great something, we are gonna have a lesser something as well. So over here on the lateral, or a small in this case, we have a small saphenous vein that basically comes up and feeds into the popliteal on the lateral aspect. So we have those two, but other than that, like I said, for the most part, we have nice symmetry all the way back up to the inferior vena cava, the same way with the arteries. All right, so like I said, that was not every blood vessel on your list, but it was a lot of the wonky ones, uh, and again, some of the more confusing ones. So hopefully that will help you on your passageways so you can find interesting parts of the body to give me driving directions to on your cardiovascular exercises. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. Well, the good news is that's actually all I wanted us to be able to cover for today. We are doing very well on our schedule, and so it looks like we will finish a little bit early, which is a good thing. You guys have a lot of physiology you have to do over the next couple of days, a lot of anatomy to work on, so this will give you a little bit of time to work on some of your lab-type things uh, on your own pace for this. So this gets you a little bit more extra time to be able to work on that. All right, so any questions on any of that? before we call it a day. Before you run screaming from the building, let me remind you to be safe and careful. Have a happy but safe and responsible uh, holiday weekend. I know it's not really a holiday weekend for us because we don't get to take a day off from school. Uh, we still have to be back here on Tuesday. So again, watch your alcohol intake on Monday so that you're not too hungover in time for class on uh, Tuesday. But be happy, be safe, be healthy, be responsible. All right, take care of yourself and those around you. All right. Thank you, Professor. Uh, cardiovascular system exercise absolutely is counted for correctness. So yes. So again, remember, the spaces I've given you, I've given you enough spaces. So again, if you are uh, too short or too long, then you're not using the right number of blood vessels. So again, and then for your own, you get to set those up however you want. You get to pick two destinations for that. All right, any other questions? All right, like I said, luckily we get finished a little bit early today. So excellent, we get an early start to our weekend. Uh, you guys, like I said, have a good time, be safe. If you have any questions, see, please feel free to email me. Otherwise, I will see you guys on Tuesday. All right. Oh, Thank Professor? You. Yes. yes, yes. Uh, I had a quick question. Uh, I just thought of it right now uh, yeah. off the sidebar uh, for the liver. Uh, so uh, like I watch a lot of MMA and all that, and they talk about uh, how liver blows can be really deadly. Is that because of the um, of all the blood that drains to it, or is that just because it's uh, more exposed in comparison to most organs? Well, the liver is the largest visceral organ, and it is only partially protected by the ribs, so it does hang down a little bit more. Uh, it is also very well vascularized and a very complex organ that does, I mean, again, when we get to the digestive system, there are over 200 different functions to the liver. So, uh, and, and again, as someone who has, uh, I've actually been, uh, I've actually had hepatitis before. I actually, when I was in grad school, had an allergic reaction to an anesthetic we were using during our experiments, and I became jaundiced as a result of it. So even a minor impairment to the, I mean, to the liver can cause jaundice, can cause pain, can cause discomfort. So yeah, my guess is that either the combination of the large amount of blood going through it and the complicated vast number of functions that it has uh, makes it uncomfortable and painful and, and, and dangerous when you damage it. Okay, thank you. Yep. I had a question about varicose veins, so. Yes. Oh, great question. Yeah, you should have asked that earlier. Yes, excellent, go ahead. So that is caused by the valve to um, malfunction, right? 
Yeah, basically what happens is uh, if, and again, uh, pregnancy is another great example when it can occur, as we talked about that increase in weight, that increase of the belly, the, the decrease in effectiveness of the respiratory pump, uh, decreases in movement, things along those lines can cause an increase in pressure of the blood in those veins. And as the pressure in them increase, as the blood vessels dilate more, uh, that can cause a failing of the valves. And as they cause the failing of the valves, uh, those valves dilate and bloat and stand out a little bit more, giving you those varicose veins, that dark coloration. Uh, one of the things that they will do cosmetically is they'll go in with a laser and ablate or destroy uh, the blood in those blood vessels so that that dark pigmentation goes away. And even if you destroy that one blood vessel, as we talked about, because there are a lot of anastomoses, you're probably not significantly uh, decreasing the rate and the route at which the blood can make its way back. I can't say for certainty you're not changing it. But I think that, and again, it's not, a, it's not a surgery I'm as familiar with, but my guess is that if it dramatically changed the blood flow rate, maybe they wouldn't do it. Although I guess the things we do for vanity, maybe they would still do it. I don't know. But it, you are going to technically be decreasing the rate of blood flow of the blood back. But if it was a damaged blood vessel anyway, it probably wasn't as efficient. And so often they will ablate it cosmetically with those lasers to just destroy the pigment of the congested hemoglobin and, and, and you know, and, uh, I mean, I guess they used to do it surgically, but then you had scars and stuff. So now they mostly do it with lasers. So would doing like a plantar flexions help with that issue? Um, it can, yeah, obviously, because that's going to help to move blood back. So yes, more exercises, more stretches are things that can. Part of it also is, is some people's blood vessels, but some people's valves genetically are more predisposed to, um, to failure in that way. So if, if, you know, your mother, your grandmother had varicose veins, then chances are you're going to be more likely to have them as well. Uh, but my guess is that there are, there are things that you can do to help to, you know, facilitate that. Uh, you know, maybe a sleep hanging upside down. Like a, yeah, yeah hang, hang upside down like a bat when you sleep, maybe to help drain the legs or something like that might help as well. <laughs> oh, yeah, compression, compressions, yeah, compression stockings are something that's supposed to help a lot during pregnancy to help to, to keep that as well. If, uh, if people are bedridden uh, because of, you know, like uh, um, uh, hypertension or something along those lines, then often they'll put hey, the on the Sorry, legs to squeeze the legs to help in the circulation that way as well. Yeah. Great question. Thank you for asking that. Any others? All right. I will go ahead and pause the recording then. Uh, stop the recording, and then, like I said, I'll get this compiled and, and put up online as soon as I possibly can. You guys, like I said, have a great day, have a great weekend, and I will see you guys on Tuesday. Bye. Thank you.